Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, July 8th, 2016. So I have been told this is our final study session on Harriet A. Washington's phenomenal text, Medical Apartheid. It has been an immense pleasure privilege to read this book with you all. Uh, We are starting on chapter 15. Uh, This is the final chapter in the book, and then we will do the epilogue as well. This session will be a little bit longer just because we're going to finish it all up today as opposed to doing a short segment next Friday. So we will go ahead and get started. Again, we are on the very beginning of chapter 15, Harriet A. Washington, Medical Apartheid, Context of White Supremacy. This is audio segment number one. Chapter 15. Aberrant Wars. American Bioterrorism Targets Blacks. The development of molecular medicine based on our new understanding of genomics will allow a vast range of new weaponry to be developed. Among that range could be biological weapons specifically targeted at particular ethnic groups. Professor Malcolm Dando, Bradford University, Scotland, 1999. I must confirm that the structure of the Chemical and Biological Warfare Project was based on the U.S. system. That's where we learnt the most. Walter Basson, M.D., the Mengele of South Africa. During segregation, the long, last gasp of American apartheid, the legal standard of separate but equal meant more than racial separation. It meant inequality sanctioned by law and enforced by violence and terror. In southern states such as Florida and Georgia, segregation meant inferior education, nearly non-existent health care, and dilapidated housing that was infested by vermin, glazed with lead, and for blacks only. But as the multiracial civil rights movement gained momentum, proud symbols of the dawning new age rose. In Miami, Florida, the state built a spacious, modern, 466-unit addition to a sprawling 1946 housing complex in the summer of 1951. Unlike the older portions of the complex, it was open to blacks. This pristine symbol of hope was named Carver Village, after Dr. George Washington Carver, America's best-loved scientist. The glistening new buildings, in a fledgling town of the same name, remained black-only dwellings in the summer of 1951, but Carver Village was the largest, most impressive new minority housing development in the nation. This distinction was quickly eclipsed, however, by the complex's prominence as one of the bloodiest battlegrounds of the civil rights movement. Carver Village amounted to a desegregation of the larging housing complex, and this precipitated Klan organizing drives in Miami white motorcades accompanied by rock-throwing and the shooting of a black man. On September 22nd, two 100-pound boxes of dynamite blasted an untenanted building at the complex. 
In October, three bombs tore through Jewish schools and synagogues in the city. When threats, rallies, lynching, and drive-by shootings failed to keep Carver Village residents from demanding places at the local polls and lunch counters, the Ku Klux Klan escalated its murderous assaults. On November 30th and December 2nd, 1951, more dynamite blasts rocked Carver Village, leaving huge areas bombed out and uninhabitable. Another bomb was left on the steps of a Catholic church that was the spiritual home of anti-segregationists. And, the Miami Herald reported, floggings were reported in Orange County. December was a particularly bloody month. Dynamite blasts blew out windows and leveled walls of the Miami Hebrew Synagogue and Tiferet Israel Synagogue to punish Jewish sympathizers. And this incendiary violence was followed by the Christmas Day bombing assassination of Harry T. Moore, head of the Florida NAACP. Open racial warfare in the streets began to punctuate the exchange of acerbic racial rhetoric. But by 1960, unnoticed amid Carver Village's raucous racial strife, the dramatic bloodletting had been married to another silent species of violence, this time at the hands of the U.S. government. The U.S. Army and the CIA, like the Klan, had Carver Village in their sights. Despite U.S. insistence that it was only developing defensive biological weapons, the Central Intelligence Agency, in 1952, entered into a partnership to produce chemical and biological weapons with first-strike capability. The Army's Special Operations Division Laboratories at Fort Detrick, Maryland, served as the site of the Joint Army-CIA program dubbed M.K. Naomi. Fort Detrick's Army Chemical Corps Laboratory bred more than four million mosquitoes per day and released them in hordes around Florida, including near Carver Village. This was an experiment to determine whether these droning syringes on the wing, disease vectors in medical parlance, could be used as first-strike biological weapons to spread yellow fever and other infectious diseases, ostensibly among foreign troops during wartime. This was not the government's first local exercise in such biological, friendly fire. A similar 1995 experiment had also targeted a black area. But because it bordered a white development, people of both races were sickened. Such exposures had already tripled Florida's whooping cough cases within a year, resulting in a dozen deaths after a whooping cough virus was released in Palmetto, on Florida's west coast. Carver Village was more precisely targeted and was subjected to the same strain, which drove up 1955 infection and death rates. And 8% of these 1,080 whooping cough cases affected children 9 years old and under. By 1960, Carver Village residents had been plagued by a rash of mysterious illnesses, including the symptoms of dengue and yellow fever, and deaths. An analysis of the records of MK Ultra, of which MK Naomi was a part, suggests that the agency released various biological agents, from mosquitoes to bacteria, in hundreds of such dispersals, and the large number of exposures makes it less surprising that mosquitoes were also unleashed upon another all black site called Carver Village, this one in Georgia's Chatham County. Savannah is the county seat. Longtime Carver Village, Georgia resident Dorothy Pelote, former president of the Carver Heights Mission Improvement Organization, recalls that in 1955, young white men came to our house and talked with me and my husband. They said they were doing a study on mosquitoes and wanted to place a trap in our backyard to see how far they had spread in our area. But they didn't go into detail. They lied. They said one thing when they were really doing something else. I had figured that they were from the health department. Later, when people started getting sick and dying, I spoke with several people who recalled those boxes being placed in their backyards. After the study, they came back and got the boxes from our backyard. In 1979, 
Pilote also told the Atlanta Journal that between April and November 1956, the Army conducted a survey of residents to determine how many had been bitten by mosquitoes. But nothing was revealed to us until the 80s. I could not believe it, but those people used us as guinea pigs. After the story broke in the 1980s, victims came forward, but news accounts tended not to name them. In 1956, for example, one unnamed black woman had fainted after a swarming dark cloud of mosquitoes covered her thickly. She had to be taken to a hospital, where medical workers wondered at the bite marks covering her body. Twenty years later, she still could not walk unassisted. The phrase, human guinea pigs, is frequently a prelude to hyperbole. But Dorothy Pelote sounds far too businesslike to be a conspiracy theorist. Her speech is crisp, and her responses are unfailingly concise and on point, even impatient, as she recalls the events of half a century ago without hesitation or ambiguity. But then, she has relived those events often. In the 1960s, she organized the residents in an attempt to understand the mosquito experiments, twenty years before evidence of their true nature surfaced. The spikes in local disease and deaths convinced the Army CIA consortium that the infected mosquitoes would indeed make an effective biological weapon against the Soviets, who had no medical capability for organizing massive vaccination programs. But for years, the CIA denied that it had unleashed such biological agents against its own citizens, despite the dramatic leap in illnesses and death rates, and despite the testimony of Pelote and other Georgia Carver Village residents. The government agents could plead innocence because they knew that there was no evidence. In 1973, MK Ultra's director, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, decided to sweep up the program's paper trail, citing his agency's burgeoning paper problem. One can argue that he really intended to erase all traces of MK Ultra's nefarious experimentation in the wake of the intense media and popular scrutiny of Cold War medical aggression by the government against its own people. During the late 1960s and the 1970s, as has been detailed in earlier chapters, the media revelations of the government's unethical prison experimentation, the Tuskegee syphilis study, and the XYY experiments with black boys in Baltimore, outraged the nation. Such research scandals were generating headlines and restrictive new laws. Reporters were alive to the news value of just this sort of Frankensteinian research that Gottlieb's team had been promulgating with tax dollars. From the electrodes implanted in the brains of black prisoners by Harris Bailey, M.D., to the mosquitoes that invaded Carter Village. Gottlieb was not eager to join his erstwhile colleagues in the Klieg Lights. Also, the new legal restrictions had ended the carnival-like laissez-faire research atmosphere marked by generous funding and few questions. These developments had driven most MK Ultra researchers to search for other, less controversial sources of federal money, and others, such as Bailey, were no longer active in America. It was in this atmosphere that Gottlieb oversaw the destruction of agency and individual case files. In 1975, CIA Director William E. Colby acknowledged that the agency discarded most MK Ultra documents, including those of its subset, MK Naomi, by 1973, rendering them very incomplete. With them vanished not only the proof, but the institutional memories of yesterday's research abuses. It was as if they had never existed. But some residents of the Florida and of the Georgia exposure sites had not forgotten. They knew they had suddenly begun to sicken, and some had died of mysterious ailments after 1953. And some remembered being visited by government representatives, who made unusual requests around that time the sicknesses began. Something was amiss. Dorothy Pelote put the two occurrences together and became the point woman, seeking answers to what she was convinced was the poisoning of her community. 
However, she had no proof. That is, she had no proof for more than a quarter of a century, when American Citizens for Honesty in Government, a subcommittee of the Church of Scientology, launched a dogged, ambitious investigation report into MK Ultra's activities. American Citizens for Honesty in Government collected the heavily censored documents and collated them with known biological exposures, then released a report that included copies of the damning originals. They repeatedly used Freedom of Information Act requests to obtain the detritus of Gottlieb's purge, only to discover that all that escaped destruction were some folders full of the most mundane material imaginable. Train schedules, restaurant checks, and receipts from a wide variety of drug stores, laboratory and biological supply houses, hardware stores, and restaurants were all that remained of the top secret activities for researchers. But the few receipts for biological agents inspired the resourceful, detail-oriented reporters to decipher the more ordinary receipts in order to retrace the trail of domestic bioterrorism. They showed how circled train timetables and train ticket receipts corresponded to journeys made to Carver Village, Florida, the CIA headquarters, and the repositories of biological agents. Receipts for test animals, chemicals, and even the hiring of a crop duster dovetailed with the spread of biological agents. For example, signed, itemized receipts were issued for such items as cultures of Haemophilus pertussis, a whooping cough pathogen, in January 1955, the year that Florida whooping cough cases tripled. The documents also include physicians' bills for attention to injuries suffered by laboratory workers who handled bacteria, as well as receipts for formaldehyde and lime for burying dead lab animals, Lysol for decontaminating protective gear, nasal filters for handling microbes, and the aforementioned crop duster for field dissemination. Some receipts were stamped M.K. Naomi. Others bore the signature of scientists who were managing the project. Despite a 1969 presidential order prohibiting the production or storing of biological warfare agents, MK Ultra receipts for biological and laboratory supplies revealed that the dissemination of disease-carrying mosquitoes in Florida beginning in 1955 and 1956 triggered a long history of domestic bioterrorism by the U.S. government against its own citizens through at least 1972. Not until early 1980 did the Scientologists' research group finish piecing together its research and publish a report, which detailed, among other things, how in 1955 to 1956, the residents of Florida's Carver Village had been visited with a plague of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Swarms bred by the Army Chemical Corps at Fort Detrick, Maryland, carried, among other things, yellow fever and dengue fever. A surviving November 9, 1962, MK Ultra document described payments for drugs and other materials, including the development and testing of BW, biological warfare, harassment systems, and for large-scale production of microorganisms. Despite the checkered reputation of the Church of Scientology, regarded by many as more cult than church, the extrapolations made by subcommittee members, linking the innocuous-looking MK Ultra receipts to the deadly campaign against black Floridians, were so meticulously drawn that the rigor of the reporting gained the respect of the nation's premier periodicals. In 1979, the story was taken up by the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Washington Post, which, on March 11, 1980, described how disease-causing agents, one that could touch off undulant fever, brucellosis, and another that could bring on tularemia, were mass-produced. And there were many opportunities to utilize such germs, with unwitting American citizens serving as test subjects.
These newspapers supplied some additional evidence of how these Americans had become targets of domestic bioterrorism research. As in many other terrorist incidents, M. K. Naomi targeted an ethnically distinct group, African Americans. The New York Times wrote that the Army Chemical Corps also deployed contaminated homing pigeons in the area during the 1950s, and had mounted biological warfare tests on oat crops in the predominantly black Virgin Islands. According to the Times, at least one test caused oat crops to be infected with cereal rust, a destructive grain disease. Contrast reports on the egregious assaults on the health of Black Floridians, Georgians, and Virgin Islanders in the 1950s and 1960s, to a 1969 report that details how the government abandoned its plans to test zinc cadmium sprays in Northern Virginia to determine the extent of fallout in chemical and biological warfare, the same ostensible purpose as the Carver Village exposures. In the latter case. Concern about the possible health effects upon another group of residents, bald eagles in their nesting area, stayed the hand of government scientists. Unfortunately, these southern exposures were no isolated incidents. For decades before and after, blacks have been subjected to U.S.-mediated bioterrorism perpetrated by American scientists at home and abroad. Lately, the word terrorism. Has been bandied about widely. It has come to encompass anything from a frank physical assault to an enforced political agenda that differs from the subjects. But terrorism is best defined more narrowly, as a threat or the use of violence, including kidnapping, extortion, assault, and murder, by an individual or organization that targets innocent civilians. In contrast to mere criminality. Terrorism is employed to further ideological, political, or religious goals. Living weapons. Bioterrorism employs chemical or biological agents such as microbes and poisons in the service of terrorism. Biological weapons often consist of disease-carrying organisms, usually microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi. Or derivatives from humans, animals, or plants. These may exist in nature, or may be produced by labs. Either way, they sicken or kill via infection or poisoning. But nuclear weapons and other chemical agents are also agents of bioterrorism, because they can poison biological entities. For example, via radiation poisoning, as well as kill them outright. Bioterrorism can kill people directly, or it can kill by destroying or polluting the water, animals, and plant life upon which people depend. During World War II, the United States and Great Britain undertook the training of South African military personnel in chemical and biological weapons (CBW) development and strategy, a relationship that was to deepen and continue. With ominous implications for Black South Africans, even during the Korean conflict, the United States armed forces unequivocally documented its efforts with regard to psychological and biological warfare. Major General Robert L. Lee, Director of Plans, U.S. Air Force, noted on March 17, 1953, that the Psychological Warfare Division. Will direct and supervise covert operations in the scope of unconventional BW weapons, biological warfare, and CW, chemical warfare, operations and programs. The post-war American agricultural program produced a large amount of weaponized agents. The 1950s scientists favored distribution in bombs filled with a chemical and feather mix, which gave way to aerosol methods. These, however, were dwarfed by the effectiveness of the Soviets' hoof-and-mouth rinderpest and African swine fever mixtures, which targeted livestock. During this period, as we have seen, the Floridian communities of Palmetto and Carver Village were army targets of disease-carrying mosquitoes. Research and development on the use of wheat rust, rice blast, and rye blast, foot-and-mouth. 
and rinderpest against plants and animals, was supplemented by the experimental development of porcine brucellosis, anthrax, and psittacosis to be used against humans. But by 1969, the United States would declare that it had ceased development of new biological warfare agents. The defoliant Agent Orange constituted a biological friendly fire incident when its use backfired by triggering a variety of persistent health problems in American servicemen and servicewomen in Vietnam. The Geneva Convention banned CBW in 1963, but evidence suggests that some nations, such as South Africa, never ceased using these weapons. The refinement of weaponized biological and chemical agents by South Africa, the Soviet Union, Israel, and Iraq ushered in the current age. Throughout the 1970s, South Africa was accused of unleashing anthrax against Zimbabwe in the Rhodesian Civil War, and the Soviets were reported to have used glanders against Afghanistan in the 1980s. Race and Ricin Bioterrorism is often a murderous expression of ethnic hatred. In the United States and in South Africa under apartheid, this hatred has been racial in nature, whether white Rhodesians poison communities of its black majority or white American Christian supremacists modeled on the Klan targeted African Americans. Sometimes the ethnic element lurks below the ideological surface, but U.S. groups with frankly racial political agendas often mount baldly racial attacks. The chief aims of today's violent cults are not only political and social fanaticism, but also genocide. Unsurprisingly, right-wing extremists devise most domestic acts of bioterror against blacks. For example, in 1987, the Arkansas white Christian supremacist group known as the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord amassed 30 gallons of potassium cyanide to poison urban water supplies throughout the nation. They relied upon God, they said, to ensure that only blacks, Jews, and non-believers would expire. Their stated aim was to topple the federal government and hasten the second coming of the presumably white Gentile Messiah. Before the covenant could complete this curious act of biological faith, the FBI infiltrated it and arrested its ringleaders. In 1989, Yet another group of violent racial extremists deployed a gas bomb that injured eight people in the Atlanta office of the NAACP. These acts of domestic bioterror continued unabated through the end of the century. FBI infiltrators foiled the April 1991 attack on the nation's water supply that the right-wing Patriots Council of Minnesota planned to undertake with ample stores of the deadly toxin ricin it had manufactured from castor beans. In 1995, yet another American neo-Nazi group stockpiled bubonic plague, apparently purchased from a Maryland firm that provides biological agents for scientific research. But even leftist radicals have targeted blacks through CBW. In fact, the first legally proven fatality from domestic bioterrorism was the 1973 murder of West Oakland School Superintendent Dr. Marcus A. Foster, an African-American, who was felled by a cyanide-tipped bullet from the arsenal of the Symbionese Liberation Army. According to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the FBI had mounted 74 investigations involving domestic chemical and biological warfare and nuclear attacks by 1997. The next year, cases ballooned to 181 investigations. Approximately 40 of these were deemed credible threats. But the press reports have tended not to characterize such coordinated domestic genocidal aggressions as bioterrorism, but merely as bizarre weapon attacks by the lunatic fringe. Small, violent groups of every stripe embrace CBW as the poor man's nuclear weapon. Easier? cheaper, and churning more pervasive anxiety than a gun or a bomb. 
Today, the most notorious pathogens that threaten humans are Yersinia pestis, which causes bubonic plague, Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, and viruses such as variola, the cause of smallpox, and hemorrhagic fevers such as Lassa, Marburg, Ebola, and Hanton. Most of these have been considered for weaponization. The Color of Counterterrorism The terrorists' felling of the World Trade Center towers and concomitant attack upon the Pentagon were followed a month later by anthrax attacks, in which five people died and thirteen were sickened. When anthrax was found in mail addressed to several congresspersons and contamination was suspected, Congress was immediately shut down and lawmakers fled the buildings, which were immediately closed and sealed, then decontaminated. But at the Brentwood Mail Processing and Distribution Center facility in Washington, D.C., where 92% of the 2,646 workers were black, letters contaminated with bacillus anthracis spores were processed by both machines and human handlers. Four U.S. Postal Service workers at Brentwood fell ill with what was tardily diagnosed as inhalation anthrax. Two died. Many African Americans perceived a clear racial disparity in how the black and white victims of the anthrax attacks were treated. Thousands of D.C. area postal workers may have been exposed to anthrax spores from contaminated letters, such as those mailed to Senators Thomas A. Daschle and Patrick Leahy. Although inhaled anthrax is 89% fatal, a three-day delay intervened before these workers were treated with a 60-day course of antibiotics. Afterward, postal workers were offered the same experimental anthrax vaccine that was being tested on U.S. soldiers without their consent, which is discussed in the epilogue. But instead of a clear recommendation from government physicians, postal workers were told that making the complex decision to risk the experimental vaccine and its possible side effects was their own responsibility. Prominent epidemiologists gave conflicting advice. Some cited the dangers of side effects, and other experts stressed the need for additional protection such as adjunct vaccine to discourage the development of anthrax in the exposed, because the antibiotics offered protection only up to 60 days. But no one had warned the workers that the 60-day course of antibiotics they accepted would not be sufficient to protect them. And when workers were belatedly told of this and offered the experimental vaccine to supplement the antibiotics, this fed rather than damped their suspicions. This offer of a vaccine also seemed to contradict government assurances that the facilities were perfectly safe. When HHS Secretary Tommy Thompson finally officially recommended the vaccine, suspicion reigned among the black staffers that experimentation, not treatment, was the real goal of vaccine administration. The situation was not improved when Washington, D.C. Health Director Ivan C. A. Walks and Mayor Anthony Williams advised workers to shun the vaccine because of its side effects and unproven efficacy. There was a public perception that people on Capitol Hill got treated quickly and effectively and lost no one, while the perception at Brentwood was that people were ignored and lost two co-workers, said Walks. The coverage by Black Enterprise, a highly respected financial magazine, was entitled Cures for the Privileged? Nor did the Washington Post shrink from reporting the racial nature of the distrust. Using words like guinea pigs and references to the Tuskegee experiments, postal workers, many of whom are African American, said that two times now the Bush administration has relegated them to second-class status. These are the same guys that told us, when the Dashiell letter went through, that it was perfectly okay to go into Brentwood, said Azizali Jaffer, the Postal Service's Vice President for Communications. Meanwhile, four machines at New York City's Morgan Station Center tested positive for anthrax, prompting the union to demand its closure and decontamination before workers returned. 
They, too, cited the alacrity with which congressional representatives had been evacuated and Congress was adjourned to nullify the risk of contamination. But the USPS responded with a 10-day supply of Cipro, latex gloves, paper masks, and a refusal to test the employees or to close the facility. It's absurd. It's criminal. There are live spores in these machines, protested one union representative who refused to return to work. By November, 30% of the facility's employees had joined him in boycotting the postal facilities. In the end, only the machines, not the building, were decontaminated. The New York Area Metro Postal Union's president, Willie Smith, an astute and plain-spoken everyman, laid the case of resentful postal workers, many of them black. We're simply asking the post office to close the building and make sure it's safe, Smith told the New York Times. I realize that Morgan employees are not Supreme Court justices or senators or congressmen, but they are God's children. They have the same right to life as the aristocrats. No one piece of mail is worth a human life. It remains to be seen how much of the Defense Department's domestic preparedness program's $40 million allocation for 120 U.S. cities will be used to protect the largely African-American postal workers who believe themselves on the front line of domestic bioterrorism threats. White Weapons The racial nature of CBW attacks is hardly confined to U.S. borders, and neither is the key role of U.S. scientists. Iraq's chemical warfare against the Kurds is often given as the most recent use of ethnic bioterror on the global stage, but it is not. The most recent biological warfare was the South African apartheid government's decades-long CBW terror campaign waged against its black majority and against neighboring black states. The physicians who headed South Africa's Chemical and Biological Warfare Program, CBWP, were able to carry out their genocidal bioweapons campaign only with the help of American scientists. The current media obsession with bioterrorism focuses upon violence perpetrated by the politically marginalized upon developing nations. But this focus has obscured the vigor with which powerful governments can wield biological weapons against weak, racially distinct groups. For example, by the 1980s, the South African apartheid regime felt increasingly threatened by opposition abroad. As its scientists and universities were cut off from the global community by academic boycotts and economic divestitures, the black anti-apartheid movement was being joined by persons of other races, and the multi-ethnic African National Congress, ANC, was gaining power and influence. In response, apartheid politicians and scientists funded research and development into exotic biological and chemical weapons for use against the black majority, so that the power of weaponized biologicals might help the white minority to destroy its opponents without firing a shot. Some apartheid-era scientists were skeptical at first, but others were certain that biological weapons could cripple and even kill enough anti-apartheid activists to allow them to control the nation's black majority. Not one of the scores of CBW scientists was black or colored. South Africa's systematic murders via biological agents are important to this book because so many of the scientists involved in crafting South Africa's racist bioterror were Americans. In fact, the science of apartheid could not have existed without the avid participation and guidance of a handful of American scientific renegades. The existence of this genocidal medical program was dragged from the shadows only in 1999, when police arrested Dr. Walter Basson, the most powerful medical man in apartheid-era South Africa, on a Johannesburg street for the illicit sale of 1,000 ecstasy pills. Prosecutors allege that he had financed a bizarre assortment of racist bioterror activities by the sale of illicit drugs. 
but Bassam was not merely a crazed drug dealer. As head of South Africa's CBWP, he was a highly respected scientist, a confidant of the Surgeon General, and he held administrative positions at several major hospitals, supervising staff who were shocked to read of his biological doomsday schemes in the pages of Pretoria newspapers. On October 4, 1999, Bassan stood trial in Pretoria. Although he was accused of murdering, by the most conservative count, 229 people, all black with poison, he was charged with only 67 deaths. His accusers included all of his surviving former confederates. Each testified at his trial that Bassan had engineered South Africa's rampant, far-ranging campaign of chemical and biological warfare against its own black citizens and against black denizens of neighboring African states. Bassan also faced scores of other fraud, murder, and drug-related charges, which South African newspapers and trial transcripts recounted daily. These charges, which are far too numerous to list in their entirety, included accusations that Bassan supervised cadres of government scientists who grew cholera cultures for use in black townships and against anti-apartheid demonstrators, directed the production of huge quantities of narcotics, including ecstasy, to be sprayed upon anti-apartheid demonstrators to pacify them, and supervised the development and use of poisoned foods for use in assassinations. Bassan's James Bond armamentarium included umbrellas that fired poisonous darts and hypodermic needles housed within screwdrivers. However, Bassan was no lone renegade. As head of South Africa's CBWP, he operated under the aegis of his personal friend, South African Surgeon General Niels Nobel. The CBWP's most dramatic political function was as an assassin of anti-apartheid heroes. One former security police officer testified to the Pretoria High Court that in 1989, Bassan poisoned the Reverend Frank Chikani of the South African Council of Churches, a charismatic anti-apartheid activist, by picking the lock of his suitcase and powdering the reverend's underpants with toxins. No black South African leader was safe from Bassan. According to testimony by former CBWP scientists at Bassan's trial, Nelson Mandela was still imprisoned when Bassan's cadre of scientists plotted to poison him slowly with the heavy metal thallium to render him mentally incapable of managing the nation's anti-apartheid resistance. Shillingly, the well-connected Bassan once cooked dinner for an unsuspecting Mandela at a mutual acquaintance's dinner party. But Bassan was most adept at designing large-scale weapons of mass destruction, specifically tailored for blacks. Bassan concocted a plan to saturate T-shirts with chemical agents, then to distribute the shirts gratis throughout impoverished black townships. Equally reprehensible was the CBWP research on an agent that would temporarily turn a white man's skin black in order to allow agents of the South African Defense Force to infiltrate black groups. Dr. Bassan's chemical grasp exceeded the borders of South Africa, targeting blacks in other African countries. In just one incident, Bassan's erstwhile lieutenants described how they forced 200 Namibian prisoners onto a plane, injected them with an experimental muscle relaxant that collapsed their lungs, then dumped their bodies from the plane into the sea. The death of activist Stephen Biko is attributed to similar poisoning administered after he was beaten by South African security police and deprived of medical care. The Washington Post even traced the 2001 U.S. anthrax attacks to the South Africa's CBWP. Evidence taken from a Frederick, Maryland pond by the FBI suggests that perpetrators handled the deadly bacterium underwater without infecting themselves or releasing the anthrax spores indiscriminately. This technique was devised by the CBWP. 
The South African bioterrorist campaign depended upon very close relationships with U.S. scientists. Despite the supposed isolation imposed upon South African scientists by the international embargoes of the 1980s and 1990s, Bassan and his minions could not have undertaken biological warfare without the support of the U.S. government. From 1981 until 1993, the United States supported Walter Bassan's weaponization programs by financing close collaborations with U.S. scientists and by sponsoring Bassan's sojourns to the United States for conferences and education. For example, in 1983, Bassan attended a closed Department of Defense conference on biological and chemical warfare in San Antonio. During his trial, Bassan recounted his participation in a 1981 federal conference in San Antonio with Army officers from the United States, West Germany, Japan, Britain, and Canada. He declared, I must confirm that the structure of the CBWP project was based on the U.S. system. That's where we learnt the most. Bassan says he was also grateful for expert American consultants, because the CBWP was dependent upon a colorful assortment of American scientists, especially Larry Ford, M.D., of California. Ford and Bassan shared strange research proclivities, acerbic racist sensibilities, and a fascination with scientific genocide. Extant medical and legal documents and the testimony of Bassan's former confederates under oath describe their shocking joint research projects. According to Ford's lawyer, he was a chemical weapons researcher for the U.S. government in the 1980s. In 1987, the United States sent him to South Africa to train microbiologists at the military-run Rudeplatt Research Laboratory, RRL, a key component of South Africa's chemical weapons program, and a front for the apartheid South African Defense Force. Ford returned often to teach RRL scientists how to produce biological agents such as anthrax and botulinum toxin for use as weapons against anti-apartheid forces and against blacks in general. He also taught apartheid's defenders how to transform innocuous objects such as doilies and tea bags into biological weapons. His seminar series, A Master Class for Poisoners, proved popular among South African scientists, who dubbed it Project Larry. Lieutenant General Lothar Neetling, head of the apartheid's regime's police forensic laboratory, was in attendance. So was RRL microbiologist Dr. Mike Odendahl, who recalls, Ford spent an entire day showing us how to contaminate ordinary items and turn them into biological weapons. He says Ford gave them ideas about how to infiltrate innocuous objects such as perfume or household items and place them in close proximity to a potential target. Ford's expertise in the toxicology of everyday life was put to use as South African physicians busily set about eliminating the enemies of apartheid. Ford was warmly welcomed within the nation's top echelon of medical politicians. For example, the home of former Surgeon General Dr. Niels Nobel is graced by a prominently placed framed photograph of him and Ford posing with a lion that Ford had shot. Back in the United States, Ford's California friends and neighbors praised him as a good Samaritan and devout Mormon to South African journalists who descended in the late 1990s to inquire into his prominent role in the recently revealed science of genocide. However, his neighbors had occasion to revise those warm sentiments on March 11, 2000. That weekend, four dozen area families had to be evacuated when police searching the grounds of Ford's Irvine home discovered 28 containers of firearms, deadly biological agents, and live ammunition. Ford himself was dead, having shot himself on March 2nd as police closed in to question him about the attempted murder of his business partner, Patrick Riley. Ford's suicide, the discovery of his biological weapons cache, 
and the unveiling of his ties to Basson, Nobel, and Project Coast, described below, all raised FBI suspicions that a multitude of American crimes utilizing bioweapons had been committed in South Africa by Ford and other U.S. scientists. Accordingly, the FBI has undertaken a weapons of mass destruction investigation. Ford's suicide spared him from his scheduled appearance to give testimony at the U.S. leg of Walter Basson's trial, where Basson faced 61 charges which encompassed murder, drug trafficking, and fraud. The CBWP's ultimate goal was the development of a pigmentation weapon that would kill or harm only black people. As apartheid waned and the legal web closed upon Basson, his former associates say that he feverishly turned his attention to the production of the unthinkable, a deadly virus that would infect only blacks. The CBWP dubbed this key endeavor Project Coast. But was this ever a real threat? How practicable were Bassan's hopes to tailor biological weapons against blacks? Very. There is strong evidence from credible sources that the unthinkable has been achieved. The active development of bioweapons against specific ethnic groups, including those specifically tailored to injure blacks, may already be an industry. As early as 1970, the respected Armed Forces Journal Military Review discussed the possibility of devising bioweapons to target racial groups. Dr. Carl A. Larson, head of the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Lund in Sweden, discussed the past targeting of racial minorities and the relative ease with which many of these weapons could be tailored to the genetic vulnerabilities of specific ethnic groups. In fact, a report entitled Biological Testing Involving Human Testing by the Department of Defense's Senate Select Committee on Health and Scientific Research indicates that the United States may have sought to develop such weapons 30 years before the Military Review article. The committee's report documents how a U.S. Navy contract supported the University of California's 1940s tests of airborne fungal spores to spread valley fever. The spores can cause deadly illness by seeding in the lungs and then infecting other body organs. Valley fever kills half of those it sickens, and the university's research found that African Americans and Asians were more susceptible to the deadly fungal infection than whites. Dr. Gerald Horn of Brooklyn College claimed that the Army and Navy investigated the fungus's possible deployment as an ethnic weapon as early as the 1940s and decades later at a 1977 congressional hearing. An unnamed Pentagon official recalled how the armed forces spread fungus in the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Virginia and on a loading dock in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. In both work sites, most of the laborers were black, and the official specified that the Mechanicsburg docks were particularly chosen because Negroes are more susceptible to the fungus than whites. Throughout the Cold War, Western newspapers were peppered with sporadic accounts of ethnic and racial bioweapons being developed by South Africa with U.S. assistance. U.S. news media broadly maligned all such reports as misinformation, disseminated by the Soviet Union to embarrass the United States. However, in 1999, a decade after the dissolution of the USSR, the British Medical Association, BMA, warned against ignoring the diverse reports that such weapons were being widely developed. The BMA insisted weapons could theoretically be developed which affect particular versions of genes clustered in specific ethnic or family groups. Its January 1999 report, Biotechnology, Weapons, and Humanity, added that the pending completion of the gene identification arm of the Human Genome Project would carry the adverse effect of facilitating the production of such weapons. This warning took on new urgency in the wake of the September 11 attacks 
and after the completion of the HGP project in 2002. However, interested scientists and nations have not waited for these milestones. A 1998 London Sunday Times story alleged that Israel already has used South Africa's research to develop a genetically specific weapon against Arabs. Such weapons development is not nearly so far-fetched nor so difficult as it sounds. Already, London police have used American scientific expertise to tailor a non-lethal weapon, the mother of all stink bombs, to specific ethnic groups. In 1998, the Pentagon commissioned scientist Pam Dalton from the Manel Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia to test disgusting odors. One question she was trying to answer was whether there were different cultural reactions to bad smells. She tested the odors on five ethnic groups, and she said that the malodorous weapons made volunteers scream and curse after just a few seconds of exposure. If these were released, they would clear an area in seconds. But most ethnic weapons under discussion are less benign. Some could be effectively crafted merely by exploiting existing variations in genetics, lifestyle, habits, health profile, and even diet. Even a low-tech approach can be quite selective. For example, approximately 82% of African Americans live in urban areas, and predominantly black urban areas have an extremely low density of white residents. So, simply striking certain areas of Harlem, East St. Louis, East Palo Alto, or Chicago's South Side, would target blacks with near-surgical precision. One could also lace particular ethnic foods marketed to African Americans with biological toxins. Infusing malt liquors, fortified wines, and African American ethnic delicacies would target blacks as well. Such scenarios may be redolent of paranoia, but the ease with which they could be realized was brought home in 1968 when the Pittsburgh Courier, a black newspaper, reported on incidents that were inspiring a fear of racial genocide among black Americans. In 1967, it reported, a white Sacramento millionaire was convicted of plotting to poison two batches of cut-rate gelatin destined for the shelves of stores in black neighborhoods. When arrested, he divulged his plans to pump cyanide through the air conditioning systems and into the water supplies of exclusively black institutions. But most discussions of bioweapons center on the strategy of selecting toxicants that affect only a selected group or that affect them far more adversely. Such agents do exist. Although toxicologists do not agree about the extent of difference, poison centers when contacted about an instance of a child eating mothballs, will sometimes ask, is he African American? Because G6PD deficiency, an enzymatic variation that is more common among African Americans than whites, enhances the toxicity of naphthalene, the active component in mothballs. Weapons could easily exploit such vulnerabilities. Similarly, if medications marketed to African Americans, such as hydroxyurea for sickle cell anemia or Bidil for blacks and heart failure, were tainted, many blacks, but almost no whites, would constitute the victims. Weaponizing the 1A genotypes of the hepatitis C virus, HCV, coupled with geographic distribution, could target African Americans. And other physiological differences between whites and African Americans could provide a fulcrum for targeted weapons. For example, as Chapter 1 explained, more than 70% of African Americans and 95% of Sub-Saharan Africans lack the Duffy gene, which is almost universal in white Americans. Therefore, developing a poison that is harmless in the presence of this gene would also target most African Americans while sparing their white compatriots. Project Coast. Under apartheid, a staggering variety of ethnic biowarfare initiatives eclipsed all the tentative musings about racial targeting. 
South Africa's Project Coast long ago moved from theory to selective racial murder via bioweapons, with the critical assistance of American scientists. In the early 1980s, fears of a black tidal wave drove white scientists to try to develop a variety of means that could ensure the survival of white South Africa. Plans were devised to build a large-scale anthrax production facility at RRL, observed the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. From 1981 to 1993, Walter Basson placed Project Coast under the direction of Dan Goosen, M.D. Goosen told the Washington Post that his division was under orders to perfect agents that would preferentially sabotage blacks' fertility and to devise a silver bullet biological weapon designed to kill only black Africans. Goosen supervised a multitude of biological assaults on black townships, including the release of pathogens and their vectors, such as mosquitoes, to seed disease epidemics there, just as the Army and the CIA had released them over Carver Village. Those involved in Project Coast also laced flyers, chocolates, letters, and cigarettes with anthrax and saturated T-shirts with poisons. Goosen, Basson, and their deputies investigated the use of mandrax, an amphetamine, and ecstasy, for crowd control, infused township water supplies with treatment-resistant strains of cholera, and deployed napalm and phosphorus against blacks in Namibia and Angola during the 1980s. Basson also ordered Goosen to suppress black reproduction surreptitiously, and suggested the clandestine addition of contraceptives to townships' drinking water. Basson stressed that this was a direct edict of the South African Surgeon General. Project Coast also set up International Shop, according to a 1989 price list that included salmonella-infused sugar cubes, pesticide-laced beer and peppermints, and a now chillingly familiar threat, envelopes sprinkled with anthrax spores. Only the fall of apartheid cut Basson's efforts short. In its aftermath, the United States and Great Britain asked F.W. de Klerk's apartheid government not to hand over the fruits of Dr. Basson's labor, the biological warfare technology, to the new ANC government. Instead, de Klerk met with Nelson Mandela, who ended the program. After the U.S. anthrax attacks in October 2001, Goosen tried not only to sell Project Coast's research documents, but also to interest the U.S. Department of Defense in a partnership for developing South Africa's repertoire of anthrax vaccines and anti-sera specialized antidotes. According to the Washington Post, Goosen's other offerings to the FBI included modified plague, salmonella, and botulism agents, and anti-sera intended to strengthen resistance to any future bioterrorism attacks. The DOD set up a January 2002 meeting between Goosen and Bioport Corp., a Michigan company that has the sole license to produce military anthrax vaccines, but no agreement was reached. The Americans demurred when confronted with Goosen's voluminous demands, which included a $5 million cash disbursement, amnesty, and immigrant status for a wide assortment of apartheid-era researchers, family members, and hangers-on. The United States did, however, quash the sale of the biological weapons to Middle Eastern nations. Thus, Goosen and the other apartheid scientists were forced to take a less lucrative route to amnesty. They confessed their crimes to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, TRC, and in this way, they escaped the sort of public high-stakes trial that threatened Basson with the loss of his medical degree, wealth, and freedom. Pretoria bioengineer Dr. Jan Lorenz, who later headed the biotech firm Protechnik, was one of the scientists who confessed and applied for amnesty to the TRC after the fall of apartheid. By doing so, he and his confederates escaped the fines and imprisonment, to say nothing of the death sentences, that had befallen their Nazi counterparts a half-century earlier. 
Faced with ruin or confession, the Project Coast and CBWP scientists admitted their years of heinous research in the service of racial genocide. Bassan, their boss, was the lone holdout. He refused to confess or to apologize, evidently hoping that he could beat the charges, even with his former subordinates arrayed against him, giving reams of damning testimony. Despite the implicating confessions by his colleagues and a slew of eyewitnesses to genocide, Judge Willie Hartzenberg dropped the murder charges against Basson in 2002 and rejected the testimony of all 153 witnesses against him. Only Basson had testified in his own defense, and Basson's was the only testimony that the judge accepted. Hartzenberg dismissed all the evidence against him and found Basson innocent of 46 charges, including murder, drug trafficking, fraud, and theft involving some 37 million rand, 3.7 million in U.S. currency. But he did not stop there. For good measure, Hartzenberg also granted Basson amnesty. The trial, South Africa's longest, had lasted 30 months and cost the state 20 million rand, $2 million in U.S. currency. In 2002, the prosecutor's request for a retrial was denied. Standing between Bassan's many accusers and a conviction was Hartzenberg, an apartheid-era judge who was widely viewed as a holdover, nursing, as he did, a strong nostalgia for white minority rule. He had remained on the bench despite an attempt to recuse him before the trial started. Once the trial began, court journalists alleged, Hartzenberg made no secret of who he most admires in his courtroom. Hartzenberg likened Bassan to the Virgin Mary in open court and threw out conspiracy and murder charges that legal analysts insist should have been prosecuted. However, one needs no legal expertise to wonder how Bassan could be innocent when so many of his key lieutenants testified in detail and with consistency about crimes they committed together. Bassan's innocent verdict had been predicted by news analysts, based upon the all-white courtroom players and the pro-Bassan bias of the judge. So Bassan was right to gamble that he would be convicted of no crime and serve no sentence. The judge, the barristers, the journalists, and the scientists, both South African and American, as well as the trial analysts, were all white, leaving one to wonder, who speaks for the black victims of Dr. Death? ANC official Smuts and Goyama resorted to understatement. The justice system has let us down on this case. A September 2005 appellate court decision raised hopes that this bleak failure of the South African legal system may yet be mitigated by some measure of justice. The appeals court found that Hartzenberg had erred in throwing out charges related to the deaths of hundreds of blacks outside of South Africa, those in Namibia, Mozambique, Swaziland, and the United Kingdom, between 1979 and 1989. Citing a real and substantial connection, the court granted South African prosecutors permission to reopen six charges of conspiracy and murder against Bassan in the deaths of ANC members, Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO, members, and others marked as enemies of the apartheid state. However, in late November 2005, South Africa declined to prosecute, citing the prohibition against double jeopardy. South African prosecutors have abandoned hopes of trying Bassan again. But in 2006, as this book went to press, the legal systems of neighboring nations, such as Namibia, were considering attempts at extradition and trial. As for bioterrorism back in the United States, a similar campaign for the truth against government-sponsored bioterrorism was proving equally futile for its black victims. As mentioned earlier, MK Ultra the CIA mind control program that began in 1953 had been exposed by investigative reports as the culprit in the biological assaults on black Floridians, Georgians, and Virgin Islanders. Of course, 
This was not news to Georgia legislator Dorothy Pelote, whose descriptions of her frustrated attempts to attract governmental recognition of the atrocities at Carver Village opened this chapter. Pelote's grateful neighbors elected her county commissioner, then state representative in 1984, and she never stopped trying to get an acknowledgement of the government's actions in Carver Village and some compensation for her neighbors. In 2004, she explained to me that the exposure by the Church of Scientology and the national news media had failed to bring justice to Carver Village's victims. We had several meetings that were very regularly attended by representatives of various organizations and the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and our congressman sent someone. We talked about it, but because we were lay people, we needed expert advice and some people we needed to dialogue with did not show. Later, some people from the government approached me, saying they were going to have congressional hearings, but they never did. They never called me back when I called about it. Pelote is passionate about health issues, large and small, that pollute the lives of those residing in forgotten small communities like Carver Village. Although she may appear unprepossessing to the uninitiated, Pelote has accrued a great deal of political power because her constituents trust her, and she has not been reluctant to wield that power in what she considers their best interests. This has earned her some political enemies, and she has been ridiculed for some of her legislation. For example, she introduced a bill to prevent supermarket baggers from licking their fingers to open recalcitrant plastic bags while packing customers' groceries. Much was also made of murky claims Pelote made regarding the fate of Chandra Levy, the 22-year-old intern who disappeared in 2001. Reports of her affair with California Representative Gary Condit were disclosed at the time. Levy's body was found 13 months later in a wooded area, as Pelote had predicted. But the Scientologists' report and subsequent mainstream news media accounts of biological agents at Carver Village validated Pelote, and later news reports revealed some projects of which Pelote had never dreamed. For example, MK Ultra scientists had utilized technology in the form of a machine they devised called a biogen. It mass-produced pathogens, including cranking out huge vats of cultures that could cause fatal illnesses. The CIA financial archives include invoices for the maintenance and repair of the machine over a period of 13 years. During that period, the Washington Post speculated, MK Ultra scientists may have produced hundreds of pounds of various biological agents and microorganisms. The biological agents used as friendly fire to test the vulnerabilities of blacks in Carver Village represented just the first wave of governmental domestic bioterrorism. The Biology of Doom, a book by Ed Regis, described how whites as well as blacks were targeted by government-produced pathogens in other cities. In San Francisco, light bulbs filled with purportedly benign bacteria were purposely disseminated in public areas, where they were dropped in the subway system so researchers could study how effectively the pathogens would spread. The Special Operations Division used custom-fitted suitcases in 1964 and 1965 to spray bacteria onto unwitting passengers in Washington, D.C.'s National Airport and in Greyhound bus terminals. The Special Operations Division scientists counted the tickets sold at the time of exposure and thus were able to determine that the infected passengers spread the bacteria to more than 200 cities. These tests were undertaken to determine the results of using smallpox or other deadly biological agents in public places. But unlike what occurred with the Carver Village exposures, the agents substituted purportedly harmless bacteria called Bacillus subtilis, a bacillus in a rod-shaped bacterium that grows in the presence of air. However, B. subtilis is not harmless. We now know that it triggers respiratory infections, blood poisoning, and food poisoning. Other major cities were not spared. A 1979 report exposed Operation Big City, 
the CIA's 1956 secret biological warfare experiments that were conducted in the New York subway system in partnership with U.S. Army personnel. These exposures were more democratic than those detailed here and affected people of every race. But still other projects that targeted the Northeast demonstrated the CIA scientists' special interest in targeting African Americans. For example, another round of tests in various East Coast cities sought to validate claims that a species of fungus caused lung disease in blacks more often than in whites. It was sprayed throughout an area where more blacks than whites worked. An army report stated that the purpose of this exposure was to test this vulnerability, because within this supply system there are employed large numbers of laborers, including many Negroes, whose incapacitation would seriously affect the operation of the supply system. Senator Paul Wellstone, Democrat, Minnesota, commented, No one should ever have been subjected to these tests, and he helped to mount a congressional investigation into the project's health effects on the subjects. None of these large-scale biological assaults on black Americans has been formally acknowledged by the government. Dorothy Pelote retired in 2001, after nearly three decades in public life, although she remains active in attempting to protect the health of her community. But as she leaves the government arena, and as the affected residents of the nation's Carver Village age and die, a real danger looms that the memory of government-mediated bioterrorism will die with them, unless it happens again. Context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast. Uh, that is the first audio segment, Medical Apartheid. Uh, that technically, I guess, is the end of the book, although the epilogue is coming up, and the epilogue is um, relatively lengthy. So we have a, a full second segment to come. Uh, if you would like to participate, the number to dial is 641-715-3640. The code is 564-943. Pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Number again, 641-715-3640. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, if you want to share your thoughts and you don't want to use uh, your phone, you can use the uh, free Vope line. It uh, should be linked at Black Talk Radio Network. If you need the address, it is tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, forward slash one race. And that is the number one. Address again, tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, forward slash one race and that is the number one when you put in that address click the link on the left of the page that says free vote line uh it will take it will open a small window on your screen on the top line you'll see the number that i just gave out which again is six four one seven one five three six four zero Next line, it will ask for the code. That code again is 564943. Final line, it will ask for a name. Uh, you can put in your real name. You can use a nickname. Uh, if you just want to press random keys, whatever works for you. Once you get all that information entered, click the green button at the bottom. It will connect you to the live program. Uh, you should be able to hear us uh, once you dial in and, and press enter and all that. Uh, it's the same procedure. If you would like to participate, you'll see the dial pad on your screen. Press star six. Uh, when you do that, you will get an audio prompt to press the number one. Do so. We'll see your hand on the switchboard and we will get you on the line as this is the final segment on medical apartheid. If you want to be thinking of uh, concluding thoughts, kind of some of the main themes uh, if you see major patterns 
uh, things that she talked about that seemed to be consistent no matter what era she was talking about, uh, formal plantation slavery, things that were happening uh, on the continent, South Africa, uh, Tuskegee, whichever era was going on in the prisons, Holmesburg, back in Philadelphia that we talked about before. Major themes, some of the more important important uh, points uh, that you think Miss Washington highlighted uh, over the past couple months that we have been reading this book. Uh, I know, again, that word white privilege has been in the forefront of my mind, uh, hearing about all of these dastardly and conniving acts uh, that have unfolded over centuries. Uh, this is a brilliant illustration of the massive incorrectness of that term. Uh, I, I cannot think uh, a more incorrect and disingenuous way to categorize this, I mean, just <laughs> macabre record of terrorism against black people to say that this is just a little white privilege, that whites don't have to be subjected to this sort of thing on a constant and systematic basis. Anywho, we will get to the phone lines. If folks can make an effort uh, to not deviate uh, Hopefully we won't have too many uh, just personal anecdotes uh, about, you know, things that you've experienced. I feel like there is a wealth of information in this here text uh, to dissect uh, and speak on if we cannot divert and be talking about other things that have nothing to do with the book uh, or just, you know, little personal stories that happen to you throughout your life that are somewhat tangentially related uh, to the subject matter. I just think uh, since this is the last segment on the book that we should devote uh, our focused attention on uh, what we have read over the last couple months, particularly since this is a massively important book. That said, all the folks who dialed in who have a hand up should be with us. Uh, feel free to share. Have you heard? Yes, sir. Good evening, Doc. Good evening to all the callers. Tom Smith in New York. Um, so glad this book ended with um, all the governmental um, things, the MK Ultra, my control ultra, and Trillian Candidate Ultra. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to hear anything about uh, five cops getting killed after reading this book and seeing the stuff they've done to us, I mean, that's just straight to us. Um, it, it, it has no no comparison. Um, and, oh, man, South Africa, my God, I mean, man, I mean, you think it's nothing worse than uh, the United States and then you need some of the stuff they do. Um, just totally ridiculous. Um, I... And um, here we have the the music, and I, I think that you know I can't see them making mosquitoes using mosquitoes to deliver uh, weapons to Russia. You know, I, it just I mean I I, I personally have um, always thought Russia was very cold. <laughs> and, um, mosquitoes, and so the, the, I think those are all made for us. Uh, any of these delivery systems with a mosquito made for people who live in tropical climates, and that's normally people of color uh, because white people can't take the sun. And um, the, the Zika today, I mean, that has to be one of their weapons. I mean, it just follows the patterns of, you know, all of a sudden these mosquitoes could bite you and deliver some type of... Um, type of disease that wasn't around before, um, just doesn't add up. Um, also, um, the, just, just hearing the parts about South Africa and um, just having knowledge of that's where, you know, possibly the AIDS virus started and just hearing the diabolical things, putting stuff in, um, putting anthrax in t-shirts and I mean, these people are so such calculated killers. I mean, it's, it's even their scientists, even their most esteemed people. And these are the people that win these awards and they build monuments and colleges and schools after. And, you know, um, these people were trying to kill us. That's why they're being awarded. Um, this is just, this book is a very good book. I think uh, in a very intellectual way it was an indictment on white people and their criminal medical system and just how everything works 
um, within the system um, as far as health care, as far as why certain things. I mean, just the fact that they could put a certain score in the ear just to test it on people, that just shows you that their level. I mean, like Mr. Fuller says, um, they'll test a grain of salt, a grain of sand at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, they not only come up with these diabolical plans, they actually go forward with them and, and experiment with them. And, um, you know, I have a lot I can say, but I'll mute my line. Thank you. Yes, sir, happy to hear Yes, sir, Mr. Demery Four. Uh, greetings. Greetings, Gus. Uh, greetings to all the callers, listeners. Uh, when you started out in Chapter 15, Aberrant Wars, you know, you would think that a title like that would be appropriate, you know, being war, war against uh, your country's own citizens. But then those of us who are less confused, you know, know that it's not abnormal or out of the ordinary. Uh, whites warring against blacks because we are in a war, and that is for sure. They are just taking it to a new level <clears throat> with the uh, chemicals and the biological weapons. But I'd like to speak about the when they decided to build those 466-unit addition to a housing complex in uh, Miami, Florida, I suspect that they knew what was going to happen because Florida um, would not win any uh, liberal awards during that time. They were uh, oppressing blacks in a you know, a horrendous way. And then naming the complex after George Washington Carver, and she called him the best love scientist, which he was brilliant and a genius. But then uh, he suffered greatly uh, in America with this racism. His mother and father both were, had died. His father killed uh, through racism. His mother, him and his siblings were kidnapped and ransomed. He was sold to a white man as an infant, and then it's even rumors that he was castrated at an early age, about 11. So he had a real high-pitched voice, but he dedicated his life to plant research, and uh, uh, he became a brilliant man, but no one escapes uh, this system. And it also mentioned Harry T. Moore, <clears throat> the NAACP uh, leader that ended up being killed on Christmas Day. Bomb blew up underneath his house. It's just no uh, limit to what these uh, white terrorists would do. Uh, even uh, retaliations on Catholic uh, churches that were sympathizing uh with anti-segregationists and uh, blowing up synagogues. But, you know, blaming all this on the Ku Klux Klan when uh, the average citizen, the majority of whites at that time, had the same uh, mindset. And it just wasn't some crazed individuals that were uh, renegades from the KKK. Uh, she did uh, mention uh, Dorothy Pelot, who was uh, a fearless uh, leader and organizer. And she suspected something when they came to her house to put those boxes in her backyard, talking about trapping mosquitoes. You've got to be suspicious, you know. And then later on, they found out. See, it was a year later or so before they found out what was actually going on. And uh, <clears throat> says down here on page uh, 261 that in 1979, Pelot also told the Atlanta Journal that between April and November 1956, the Army conducted a survey 
of residents to determine how many had been bitten by mosquitoes. But nothing was revealed to us until the 80s. I could not believe it. But those people use us as guinea pigs. That's the kind of pattern we see consistently with victims uh, that underestimate the uh, pathology of whites. You know, you just cannot believe. I know that maybe even people listening to my voice find it hard to believe that the United States government and the CIA was actually involved in biological and chemical uh, sabotage of their own citizens. Um, I thought it was also interesting that uh, on page uh, 364 that the uh, this group, let's see, what were they called? Uh, the Scientology Research Group that put together uh, a report that detailed uh, some of the things that happened in Carver Village with the mosquitoes. They had proof that the mosquitoes was carrying yellow fever and danger fever. Uh, you know, it's just information may come from uh, weird places, but at least they were able to piece together what actually happened in there from from those efforts. But uh, any of these uh, uh, Geneva Conventions, any acts or uh, treaties that they came up with, it looked like it's a pattern that they may come up with this, but uh, white supremacists do not abide by any treaties or any uh, pacts that they have previously made, it looked as though they had uh, treaties uh, that you would not use biological weapons, but uh, the, the book said uh, some of these people never even, uh, South Africa never even regarded those treaties. They constantly uh, experimented, well, not experiment. they exposed their citizens to uh biological and chemical weapons. And uh, one last thing is this guy, a Volta, a bus son. I just thought it was strange that after all the killing that he did, 226 black people that he killed, you know, using biological weapons, all the harm that he did, then... Uh, uh, Mandela was in, instrumental in um, influencing, uh, you know, his acquittal, I guess. But these white people can do anything they want to do. They don't need any approval from <laughs> Nelson Mandela. But I'll mute my line on that. It's just uh, uh, he should never have been given amnesty. He should have uh, been injected with some of those same uh, agents. I'll mute my line. Thanks for taking the call, Gus. For sure, for sure. I just want, before I nab the other folks who dialed in, just uh, he, Mr. Demery Ford mentioned the title of the chapter we just heard, Chapter 15, Aberrant Wars. Uh, and uh, I said, wait a minute, I'm not sure. I know what that word means, uh, and I looked it up. Uh, one of the other reasons I always love having the ebook version because it is super easy to look up words. Just double tap and boop, there it is. Uh, so I looked it up, and it says aberrant, departing from an accepted standard. Uh, if anything, the other 14 chapters that we read leading up to this, this is standard operating procedure. Everything that I heard uh, in Chapter 15, I don't see any sort of uh, deviation or any sort of departure from what whites have been doing to blacks uh, that has been documented in the other 14 chapters at all. It just seemed like an upgrade, like, oh, we have new ways of going after the niggers. But I didn't see any sort of departure at all. But, uh, you know, that's just words are important. Definitions are important. And certainly the, the title chapters are extremely important when reading a text. Uh, other folks that we have not heard from, uh, everyone who has a hand up should be with us. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings to you, Gus, um, to Mr. Demery, uh, Thomas, and um, all the other callers and listeners. Um, weirdly enough, when you just discussed um, the term aberrant, I think and the way that I see it, just from the 
just what you said about the meaning. You're absolutely right about it being standard operating procedure for white people. I think it's aberrant. The aberrance means in the sense of how non-white people function because non-white people don't do these sorts of things. We've never run around creating biological and chemical agents to kill massive amounts of other people under this um, psychotic racial motivation. So I think the aberrant, aberrance she's discussing is the aberrance as far as out of the norm for non-white people though it is the norm for white people. Um, also, I found it very interesting when Thomas talked about um, the, the um, soaking of different clothing and different items, like um, they said they soaked doilies and things like that. And I remember being um, cleaning up around my mother's house and she used to have doilies. And I just wonder how many people they kill um, where they would be in their house doing normal things, like maybe cleaning up stuff and you're picking up these items that, that are, like they say, seemingly innocuous, but these things are like literally um, soaked and infested with some kind of toxin. It also made me think of the Sinaloa cartel who um, perfected the art of making liquid cocaine and soaking clothes, like jeans and things like that, and they would have these jeans imported into the United States, where upon receipt, people would use chemicals to separate the cocaine from the clothing in order to create these kilos of cocaine which they went to sell. So it made me think maybe they got that whole idea from somehow knowing about this since the Sinaloa cartel um, was uh, is direct, we're directly connected to the CIA and, and government agencies. They, were, they made different pacts to be able to sell drugs in this country to non-white people. So it's very interesting. I just um, thought about that. But on uh, page 367, she had something really telling. I think the, holistically the book really brings home the fact that white people will do anything to commit genocide against black people. Um, and that this book really brings home the fact that the most, the most important target of all the death and destruction they seek to bring to the world is against black people. When you talk about us all the time about the difference between um, people who are not as melanated as black people and black people, I mean, this is legendary. This book is li literally legendary status to bring that idea home and that understanding. Um, on page 367, she discusses, she says, towards the bottom of the page, FBI infiltrators foiled, excuse me, foiled the April 1991 attack on the nation's water supply that the, the right-wing Patriots Council of Minnesota planned to undertake with ample stores of, deadly to of the deadly toxin ricin it had manufactured from, the, from castor beans. In 1995, yet another American neo-Nazi group stockpiled bubonic clay, apparently purchased from the from a Maryland firm that provides biological agents for scientific research, but even leftist radicals have targeted blacks through CBW. In fact, the first legally proven fatality from domestic bioterrorism was the 1973 murder of West Oakland School Superintendent Dr. Marcus A. Foster, an African-American who was felled by a cyanide-tipped bullet from the arsenal of the Symbionese Liberation Army. And I just found that really telling the fact that... Um, you know, they wanted to kill just about, every, just since I think she said over 80, 80 percent, I believe it was, of uh, black people in America are in the urban centers. So essentially they wanted to poison the water supply. And I think at one point she had said that they were, they were praying that only black people and the so-called undesirables would be affected by this attack. And this really just, um, I think, should help people to understand that they want to kill massive amounts of us, and I, I think, get us to a, a controllable population that would be subject to like complete subjugation and abuse. Um, and this population control; these are these are some of the methods. And I think the fact that they work together, these these groups, um, just work together holistically on the destruction of Black life is just very very telling. And of course, the toxin rice and made me think of uh, Breaking Bad immediately. Um, also. Oh, on page 370, she wrote on a brief paragraph, she writes, um, the racial nature of CBW attacks is hardly c confined to the U.S. borders, and neither is the key role of U.S. scientists. Iraq's chemical warfare against the Kurds is often given as the most recent use of ethnic bioterror on the global stage, but it is not. The most recent biological warfare was the South African apartheid government's decades-long CBW terror campaign waged against this black majority and against neighboring black states. The physicians who headed South Africa's chemical and biological warfare program, CBWP, were able to carry out their genocidal biological weapons campaign only with the help of American scientists. This also um, just 
kind of brings home for me something that I've said numerous times, that white people function as a global white supremacist racist superorganism, and they function as one unit. So they're telling you South Africa would have made absolutely no headway in this wholesale destruction of black life without their cousins, their counterparts, American scientists. Um, this just, and I mean, and, we have, uh, and those who know the history of Israel also would understand that Israel supported the apartheid regime with South Africa and also contributed weapons um, of the destruction of black life to them as well. So, I mean, like, they really function on a collective, holistic, global level. I think that is the genius of Neely Fuller Jr. and Dr. Welsing's work and, that, and your focus with this program, the, the, the global system of white supremacy and how these white people all function in tandem, no matter how far they are apart in the world. They are all connected by the idea of the threat of white genetic annihilation, and that genetic annihilation facilitates all kinds of just psychotic, um, twisted genocidal behavior. Um, there's so much that I highlighted. It's just ridiculous because this, this chapter alone was just in, insane. Um, on uh, page 372, she wrote us shortly, um, one former security police officer testified to the Pretoria High Court that in 1989, Bassan poisoned the Reverend Frank Chikane of, South African, of the South African Council of Churches, a charismatic anti-apartheid activist, by picking the lock of his suitcase and powdering the Reverend's underpants with toxin. I mean, like, geez, like, imagine you take a shower, you change your clothes, you want to put on clean underwear, and your underwear is laced with something so toxic that you'll absorb it through your genitalia and whatever other parts of your body that the underwear is touching for it to kill you. And again, there's so many black people that have died through these mysterious means where, you know, they're just alive one minute and they're dead the next. Um, Dr. Khalid Muhammad, um, um, uh, what, uh, Steve Coakley. I mean, there's so many that you can name. And when you start to understand the perfection of using these toxins and, and these other means of distributing biological agents, when they discuss in the book the use of umbrellas with hypodermic needles, um, this is stuff that, that literally the CIA developed where they would have umbrellas with these doctor tips that you can inject biological agents into someone just in, in passing, like you could be in the train station, somebody bumps into you, and they stab you with this, a needle at the bottom of an umbrella. You don't know it's a needle. You just think that they just injured you with the tip of the, the, the umbrella. You go home and drop dead in no time flat, and everyone just thinks, oh, he died of natural causes, or oh, he just got sick and died, when you literally, in that one chance encounter, what you would think is a chance encounter with someone in an innocuous, seemingly innocuous place, was actually um, utilized as a subversive means of delivering your death in a way in which you wouldn't even be aware of it. Um, wow. I mean, this book is incredible. The psychopathology of white people are on full display, and I think that the whole concept of looking at all white people with an eye of suspicion, I think if any book should help to solidify that psychological mindset, that codification mindset, and the importance of codification for black people, I think this book is it. I, like I said, I did uh, highlight a ton of stuff, but I'm going to give other people a chance to speak. It's just flabbergasting and mind-blowing. Thanks for taking my call, guys. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, other folks that we have not heard from, if you had commentary, uh, your line should be open. Uh, proceed. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, uh, Gus. Uh, Greetings uh, to you and the callers and the listeners. Um, Sam from South Florida. Um, real short. Uh, Gus, can you tell me what area of Florida... That uh, the car that uh, Carver Village was. Let us see. Uh, this is Miami. 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 I um, I I'm I'm in Palm Beach right now. Miami is Dade County. I'm in Palm Beach County, but um, I have and I recently found this out that I have uh, uh family members that not only live in that area but um date back date back to I guess you know, not I guess but date back to when these things were going on. So I found that, you know, I found that enlightening hearing about that. Um I always thought mosquitoes were just a part of uh the tropical region of the world. Um had no idea, no idea that they were yes for lack of better terms, at least on us as weapons. 
Um, and I, I just um, completely just blown away and flabbergasted by this book. I'm very constructive. I learned so much throughout this 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 whole uh, session, and I just just I'm I'm, I'm taking it back. So um, I'm gonna mute my line and uh, thank you for uh, taking my call. Yes, sir. Uh, other folks who dialed in that we have not heard from, uh, if you had commentary, uh, feel free. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, 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 I learned so much from this book, too, because I used to actually believe that there were certain diseases that black people were more prone to. I, you know, I had no idea that this was all chemical warfare because I was thinking about that uh, the lung disease, the burning mat die from scardiosis or something like that. And um, and the girl that used to play on the show, Martin, Tisha Campbell, she has that now, too. And, and they were saying that, you know, this is really common, common amongst black people and stuff. And I used to believe that. I had no idea that they were, you know, going through black communities and, and um, you know, spraying things like that. And and I know you say you didn't want to hear any anecdotes, but I just want to say this real quick. I remember when I was a kid growing up in East St. Louis, we, we, they used to have these huge mosquitoes. They used to call them gallon, gallon nipples or gallon nippers or something like that. And they were huge. I, I mean, there was, I'm serious about like a big as your hand. And they would follow you. I mean, they would chase you. And and they, if they bite you, it felt like being bitten by a, a needle. And then you get this big red uh, a bump, you know, that it, and it was just itch, you know, terribly. And, I, you know, since I've moved, I live in a different state, in a different city, I haven't experienced anything like that before, you know. And uh, when I, I read all this, you know, I, just, I see, I'm seeing where all that stuff comes from, you know. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. I mean, we're lying. Mm, East St. Louis was uh, mentioned specifically in the text of areas with a high population of black people. If you wanted to target and do damage to uh, Negroes specifically, that would be an area to target. Uh, other folks that we have not heard from, uh, if we had other people who uh, have not shared anything, uh, feel free. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh us and hello to all the listeners and callers yes this is i took some notes though this book is heavy um that guy in africa i don't know if i spelled it right i, I wasn't looking at the book Basant or Basant, however they're pronouncing that um i mean poisonous shirts uh, he said he can turn he can turn white people black. This is my me and my brother talk about that. They turn white people black. Um, poisoning Mandela. That's a note a note I took and I put that with if they were doing brain, if they were tampering with people's brain through biochemical chemical weaponry and maybe making you you know I mean, messing with your brain, that might explain to why Mandela, you know, some people get upset and they think that he, you know, whatever, didn't do what he was supposed to do, blaming him. But that could have something to do with it. And um, Steve Biko, I took that note, um, that the anthrax, I remember that. That was big. And then come to find out they had nothing for the workers, the post office workers that were mostly black. Nothing. Uh, despicable. Um, let's see here. That Ford person, um, I took note of that person. <sighs> despicable. Sent to Africa. And he, he did, he did stuff and only, only was about to get questioned when they found out that he attempted to kill, um, his business partner who I, I'm assuming was white. I could be wrong about that. And so he ended up doing his self-destruction. Um, let's see here. 
uh, okay, biochemical warfare against blacks. And Dr. Wilson talked about that with the AIDS virus. She said we, we didn't know what that was. That could have very well been a biochemical uh, weapon. And I'll link that with that. And then Pam Dalton was the last note I took, and she was like the stink bomb creator. So I'm going to have to look her up and research that. And um, with the 1968 Pittsburgh Courier, what they what they printed. That's That was my last note. But whew, very heavy book, and I recommend this to all young people should read this book all of our young people need to read this book i know i know 12 young people and i am gonna that's what i'm gonna do for them i'm gonna either get them the ebook or send them the physical copy and just really encourage them to read that we all need to read more but i'm i'm gonna focus in on some children that i know some young people and thank you so much i mean my line brilliant brilliant Dr. Welsing would approve. Uh, anybody else that we have not heard from, all the folks who dialed in with a hand up should be with us. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. I just want to address um, what was said on page 364. I have, uh, I have, um, I, I wasn't really much at all into Scientology, but the fact that they uh, brought out the uh, fact uh, um, the black folks in Florida was being, you know, plagued by these mosquitoes, and uh, you know, I can I can appreciate that. <laughs> I can really, really appreciate that. But you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I, I'm I'm just tired, I'm tired of racism, and and, and this this book, this, this book is so so good, and I have to agree with the um, last caller. I already have someone in mind who I want to hand the book off to because black people really, really need to know how bad racism is. And I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm just speechless. It's scary, you know. Um, I don't know. I just want to say that. I just wanted to really uh, speak for the fact that the Scientology did come out and reveal what was happening to the uh, people of Florida. Thank you very much. For sure. Have you heard? Yes, sir. Greetings, everyone. Um, as I was reading the last part, I, I'm not sure if I missed it or looked over it, but I got to reread it again. So as they were talking about the South African um, biological warfare and the use of the anthrax, what kept popping up in my head was the D.C attacks on anthrax and I'm trying to make the correlation. I believe these guys were the same people that was responsible for what happened in DC and then the case was just shut down. Um, am I correct on that thought process? Um, what do, uh, what are you connecting again in terms of the anthrax that happened in DC and anthrax that happened in South Africa? Yes, yes. I don't know if this it was the same people uh, that were perpetrating it. I know she did talk about uh, the anthrax cases that happened in D. If you're talking about the anthrax that happened, anthrax cases that happened in D.C. after uh, 9/11 in 2001, she talked about that at the beginning of the chapter uh, and how uh, the black postal workers did not get the same type of treatment. <clears throat> as some of the other white politicians and Congress members, Senate members, and that sort of thing. She talked about that at the beginning of the chapter, but I don't know if she uh, talked about it in terms of the people who were responsible for perpetrating that reportedly, allegedly, uh, and them being one and the same with uh, anything that happened on the continent with anthrax. Okay, so it must have been, uh, because we watched some documentary long, long time ago, like, uh, I'm not sure how long after that incident, and it tied people coming from the South African, were working with the South African government, and then I was always wondering, how did they get into the United States? But she just made the connection. I believe these people are the same people, a part of that group that were working over there and killing people all around the area where they lived, because they lived in a prominent South African 
or a, a prominent area where, where, you know, all white, they, they were all rich and, you know, poor villages around them, and people around them were getting sick. There, 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 we watched a documentary on that. I can't think of the name of that documentary, but it was, it was basically talking about the anthrax bombing and, um, or attack on D.C. And the FBI agents were, you know, pushed off of it because somebody high up had closed it out or told them to come off of it. <clears throat> It was basically like watching the CIA thing that was going on over there in, uh, with the drug uh, cartels over there in L.A., the building of the game. It was, it was like eerily similar. And now that I'm reading this, this part, all I could think about is that, man. It's stuck in my head. So, I'm, I'm, you know, this is <laughs> – I'm at a loss of words right now you know, because there's so much stuff going on uh, right now. Then I'm rereading this book in mind control, and you got these soldiers running around here uh, shooting up people. It's it's really eerily. It just I just see so everything suspect right now. So I'll, I'll mute my line and let everybody uh, speak. For sure, the the connection that you're making. I don't think she said that explicitly, but it for sure was coming through for me. Uh, Cause it just, it reminded me of exactly what she talked about earlier in the book with operation paperclip with them allowing uh, all of these Nazis to come in and continue their uh, scientific white supremacist research. It sounded exactly the same for me. And I have, I, I mean, it's just no logical reason if we've been participating and working on this project together and we all hate niggers, why would we be opposed to having you come in and share your science that we can apply to our niggers here? I mean, it's just, that's logic. That's one and one is two uh, to me. So, yeah, she didn't she didn't spell that out explicitly and saying that that's what happened. But to me, I I pretty much assumed that that's what happened. Um, did we miss anybody? Anybody have a hand up that we have not heard from? Got everybody, everybody who dialed in with the hand up, uh, we have heard from you. Spectacular. Uh, we do have a second section. The second section is a little longer than what we normally do, but I think, you know, everyone's interest should be piqued given, you know, the topic that is being discussed. Uh, one of the female callers uh, touched on, uh, I took many notes as well. Uh, it's just been an amazing read. I highlighted a lot of things. Uh, I probably could talk for a good hour just about, you know, some of the things that popped up in the last section. I'm going to go straight to Nelson Mandela because uh, I think this, at least in my mind, is applicable to uh, Nurse Rivers, uh, the judge. If you gave me a second, I could go back and dig in my highlights, the judge and the case. Uh, New York, where they were doing these uh, racist experiments on black children, and it was a black judge who kind of held the case up uh, in court uh, and waited and waited, and we still haven't been really been able to get information on what happened uh, with this case. Uh, or any of the other black people, I think it was the uh, Association of Black Cardiologists uh, that participated in this Bidol, uh drug that's supposed to be exclusively for black people, and they kind of gave the okay, like, yeah, this is going to be great, this is going to help black people out, Whoopee, we should do this, uh, and not asking questions about the research uh, that they conducted on this drug to make these claims that's supposed to be so great for black people. Uh, I think it's very easy for us to get frustrated and look to blame other black people uh, who knowingly and or unknowingly uh, cooperate, aid racist man, racist woman, racist child in any way. I think it's it's very easy uh, for us to get frustrated and to look to engage in that sort of behavior, that sort of response to white supremacy. Uh, and I've heard that with Nelson Mandela. But I mean, wow. I just don't think any of us, Gus T. Renegade at the top of the list, I just don't think that we have a comprehensive enough understanding of white supremacy racism to grasp the infinite number of ways that whites can manipulate our behavior so that it serves their interests, not ours, even going against our own self-interest. Now, if they're saying that this guy, uh, Bassan, that he ended up being in position where he can serve a meal to Nelson Mandela that I mean even if it wasn't him just you're in greater confinement whites are already controlling what you have to eat and we read Long Walk to Freedom where they talked about uh, they were giving him bad food and he ended up having all these digestive problems and everything because they were giving him some sort of you know poorly nourishing soup or gruel or whatever it was 
uh, that, you know, just no uh, value uh, in terms of fortifying, building up his body. And that's deliberate. That's done on purpose, not just in South Africa, but here. Uh, so they're already controlling what you're ingesting. And that certainly has a huge impact on your thoughts, speech, actions, emotions, uh, your well-being, what you are consuming. Uh, that this guy is in position uh, to be able to feed Madiba. Uh, just that alone, in addition to everything else, uh, that we could be putting chemicals in your undergarments, uh, any just cologne, perfume that you have around, just, you know, as Ross said, the most innocuous thing. It's just hanging out. You don't think it's any big deal. And whammo, you have been contaminated. Uh, infected, we can kill you, who knows, and they're doing all these mind control experiments, we've been hearing about that for weeks, uh, where they had CIA programs uh, running on not just the prisoners that were in Holmesburg in Pennsylvania, but on uh, black inmates in uh, Louisiana, uh, down in uh, Angola State Penitentiary, and I said that was, uh, in my mind, that was one of the top two most important pieces of information in the book, where she said this was done exclusively to black people looking to have some sort of mind control uh, experiments where they can figure out ways of making black people docile and controlling their speech and their behavior to make them easier to control and manipulate. If that's what they've been doing here, why would I think that they wouldn't? If you have been uh, Madiba in greater confinement for 27 years, why would I think you're not doing the exact same thing to him and any other black person who is doing anything looking like they want to disrupt apartheid white supremacy uh, and any of his subsequent behaviors after exiting 27 years of greater confinement where they're probably been experimenting on him for three decades. Why would I think that they haven't done this to manipulate him to do anything, to come out and be saying anything, doing anything? Who knows uh, what they could have done? I think Dr. Cambon even mentioned that, but that's the sort of thing that I think it's, it's just very difficult to lose sight of when you just don't have an adequate appreciation for the myriad of ways that whites can exert direct and indirect control over our behavior. I think that's why it's, it's just, it's so important. It's so critical and forget all it's logical <laughs> to not spend a whole lot of time, uh, getting upset, blaming other black people for how they respond to racism, white supremacy. You don't know how much information that person has, and you don't know how much control whites are exerting over that person to get them to do these things, to behave in this way, to say this or to do that, or to not say this. It's easy. You can include President Obama or any other black person that you can think of off the top of your head. Uh, if they're talking about being able to concoct chemicals and what have you, uh, where they can just put something uh, in perfume uh, or a bottle that's just sitting around in your premises or what have you, <laughs> anybody, uh, I'm sure, they could get to and manipulate them. Plus, they're talking about being able to go after food that's specifically targeting black people there. I mean... The Madiba thing was hugely important. That, that, in my view, I think was one of the most important things to Chapter 15. I might even put that as the third most important thing uh, that I saw in the book in terms of uh, the way that they were uh, able to manipulate and looking to manipulate uh, Madiba while he was in greater confinement. Uh, I also thought it was really important, the, the aspect I think Ross touched on. You all have covered a lot of the things that I had uh, highlighted anyway. But I also thought it was really important uh, when they talked about how South Africa, they couldn't have this uh, chemical biological warfare program in place without cooperation from whites in the states. Uh, we talked about that before. And that's another one where I think we had guests on from South Africa and some of them were upset with Madiba. I've heard people say that Nelson Mandela was an honorary white, which I just, I gag at the use of that term anyway, but particularly to be applied to Madiba, who spent 27 years in greater confinement uh, for people to blast him in that way. I mean, that's just absurd. Uh, but that is hugely important when you're dealing with racist man, racist woman. This is not an individual thing. This is not going to be a one country thing. This is going to be an entire global system. All of the whites on the planet have a vested interest in the maintenance of racism, white supremacy. If it looks like it's a little shaky uh, that niggers, wherever they happen to be at Israel, South Africa, here, Rhodesia, if it looks like they're getting a little out of control, whites in other part of the world will step up and whatever they need to do. If it's armaments, reinforcements, 
cash, troops, whatever, all of the above and then some chemical and biological warfare. You got it. And they've demonstrated this repeatedly, not just uh, on the continent with Vietnam. You had the exact same thing. Uh, That is hugely important in terms of how we uh, conceptualize this problem, uh, that this is not even if you want to think locally, nationally, globally, this is not going to be an individual white thing. This is going to be an entire white collective thing, which, again, just further evidence is that whites are not ignorant about racism, white supremacy. They are paying attention to how their system is operating worldwide, locally, nationally, globally. Also, why we really need to make sure that we're paying attention uh, to the news. Fort Detrick, uh, the Army Chemical Corporation Laboratory, uh, I believe that's in the DMV area uh, in Maryland. Uh, that facility pops up a lot if you do any research on uh, AIDS, HIV AIDS, what is called that. Uh, that facility pops up a lot where they were doing research uh, on that day. I was really glad that uh, she included Dr. Harry T. Moore. Uh, black activist down in Florida who was fighting diligently for black people, working a lot with black educators, trying to get them adequate pay. Uh, and they killed both he and his wife uh, on Christmas Day down uh, in Florida. Does not get very much attention or notice recognition for his efforts uh, in making the ultimate sacrifice at all. Um, Let's see anything else that I want to make sure I get out. I thought the por- the portion about the uh, black postal workers at the beginning and how they were mistreated with the whole anthrax. I didn't. I don't remember hearing anything about that. And a lot of this, she was just pulling from the Washington Post again. Uh, when I say read the news, uh, it does not make sense. Anybody making any excuse and all the excuses that I've heard, they're lame. They make no. They they make no logical sense at all. Uh, this was she was just pulling articles out of the Washington Post that were talking about this when black people were saying. We think this is racist, the treatment that we have been afforded, uh, and we're having direct contact, having to sort this mail and what have you that might be poisoned, as opposed to the treatment that whites were afforded uh, to make sure that their health uh, was a top priority as opposed to us. Eh, whatever, you niggers can, can get back to work. And we've talked about this before, these sort of racist attitudes towards the post office because they employ a highly disproportionate number of black people. Certainly that's going to be the case in Washington, D.C., although that might be changing now with what they call gentrification, racial dislocation happening there. Um, I also want to make sure that I get to... Mm-mm-mm. The drug aspect, I think this book has, has really made the point. Uh, somebody that I know says sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism. It's been stated repeatedly uh, in this text where they were uh, they were talking about in South Africa, where they were using ecstasy to make protesters uh, more docile, easier to control, maybe stop some of their activist work. This is standard operating procedure. I relate that to. At this moment, when you have all of this protesting and what have you about Black Lives Matter and black people saying that racism is a problem that concurrently now it's, hey, let's go ahead and legalize cannabis and having it now legal in five different states, including Washington, D.C., which is not a state technically. And it's going to be more uh, once the election season uh, kicks in this November. I am certain California is going to pass. I look at that as one and the same, just another way of making black people more docile. Let's legalize all these drugs and make it way more accessible. Let's make it way cheaper so that you can have more and more access to these chemicals, which we have probably been experimenting on for the last 30 years to target explicitly black people. The way that it has been marketed in these campaigns, I could totally see them doing the exact same thing that she outlined in this book, where the cannabis that we have available in black areas that black people are going to be consuming, we've already manipulated it. We know that that's going to mess them up for the next 50 years and render them sterile or whatever else the case is going to be. I thought that was important as well because she talked about that uh, in this section of the book and that's been a major theme throughout the text the control of the reproduction of black children, uh, finding ways of making them more docile, easier to control and finding ways of restricting the number of melanated children that are on this planet. Key to Dr. Welsing's concept of white genetic annihilation. Um, make sure anything else. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I read that paragraph because, I, as I said, this would be number three, third most important uh, theme from the book. No black South African leader, even that is a misnomer leader, uh, no black South African leader was safe from Bassan. According to testimony from former 
uh, chemical biological warfare program scientist at Bassan's trial, Nelson Mandela, was still imprisoned when Bassan's cadre of scientists plotted to poison him slowly with the heavy metal thallium to render him mentally incapable of managing the nation's anti-apartheid resistance. Chillingly, the well-documented Bassan once cooked dinner for an unsuspecting Mandela at a mutual acquaintance's dinner party. I would only say, in my view, whites lie all the time. Who's to say that they did not go ahead and poison him and carry out exactly what they wrote right here? Uh, and that resulted in some of his behaviors, thought, speech, actions once he was released from greater confinement. Who's to say that they didn't? Their chief weapon is deception, uh, lying about things. And I think she stated consistently here that one of their patterns has been to purposely destroy documents and evidence so you don't really find out what happened. Sometimes you don't find out at all, or maybe you find out bits and pieces 50 years down the road. Um, I will stop there although there are many other things that i could say uh when she talked about shooting the lion that even brought up uh was it leo the lion last summer i think i got the name incorrect what was the lion that they had the big to do about last summer that they went on safari they went over and shot him uh, and killed him uh, on the continent the white guy from here y'all remember what was the lion's name people don't remember I'm sure you have to remember. I remember the line. I can't remember his name. I'm trying oh, okay. to think of it now from the tip of my tongue. Yes, I remember. Um, oh, my God, it just almost came to me. Uh, give me one second. Let's think of this one. Whatever the little critters. Uh, Cecil, that was it. Cecil, there we go. Um, Cecil from last summer just reminded me the, the continued bloodlust. And that's just symbolic uh, of black people. Got to go on safari to the continent to kill uh, some sort of beast. Uh, wish it could be a black person. Probably did kill some black people while they're doing all this. But to have these uh, physicians that are engaged in this chemical biological warfare against black people also going out and hunting and killing lions. Just standard operating procedure amongst whites. Uh, and again, just showing that. I know it ain't me. I don't want to stop pushing these darn buttons. Uh, again, encourage folks to use your mute button if you know you uh, are going to be talking to other folks or having other things going on in the background. Uh, I think I can stop there. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, we have a second audio segment to get to uh, briefly. Anybody have a final quick comment that they want to get in very concise, something that can only take maybe five seconds or so so we can get to the second audio clip? Yeah, you know, uh, I have this, um, knowledge of the anthrax letters because um, right after 9-11, I was working uh, at, um, well, during 9-11, I was working at um, the World Financial Center. And uh, right after 9-11, I was working in the mill room. And um, being that it happened so close to our company, we were trained in how to deal with these. We were given these rubber gloves and these paper masks. And we had to wear them. We wore them for a few months. And um, years later, I ended up working in the mail room at a, a, a law firm at 30 Rockefeller Center. And they were directly attacked. And they had all types of protocols with the mail there that I never heard of before. But it was because, um, I think... Someone sent an anthrax letter to Tom Brokaw for one of them during that time period. And I'm getting my line. Roz? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead, Roz. Oh, my bad. I was just going to say, um, I found it interesting that over 20 years ago, um, Dr. Malachi York actually said that they lobotomized Nelson Mandela when they had him um, in, in prison. So to me, like exactly what you said about what Bassan did makes perfect sense. Um, maybe that, that's what he was alluding to 20 years ago, but he was the first person I heard allude to that, and now this book is basically confirming it for me on a personal level, just seeing what happened to him towards um, the end of his life, especially after he took over control of South Africa, supposed control of South Africa, I should say. Thank you. I'll mute my line. Mr. Demery? Yes. Yes, I just wanted to say real quickly that on page uh, 378, it said from 1981 to 1983, Walter uh, Bassan placed Project Coast under the direction of Dan Goosen, M.D. Goosen told the Washington Post that his division was under orders to perfect agents that would differentiate, sabotage black fertility, and devise a silver bullet biological weapon designed to kill only black 
America. And I thought it was interesting that they used silver bullets, which was actually used to kill werewolves in those uh, uh, horror movies. I mute my line. Mm -hmm. Great portion as well. That as well, I mean, and again, if we want to talk about white privilege, that is... (laughs) I don't even use the word offensive, but I mean, that is absurd. If that's what you want to call this white privilege. I mean, really. Um, But I, again, just pointing out the passage that he just read, told the Washington Post, told the Washington Post for the people who come up with the lame excuses about not checking the news. We will get to the second uh, audio segment Many other things that stood out that were hugely important uh, in that section. (laughs) I'm looking for weapons specifically to target black people. Uh, Second audio segment where more of this to come. Well, actually, this is the epilogue. So you can just turn, if you have the hard copy of the book, just go to the epilogue and you'll be good to go. Uh, This will wrap things up. Uh, It is a little longer than our normal segment, but, you know, should be great reading. Uh, Stay tuned. And once we're done, we will have time for folks to make any final observations. If you have anything uh, that you would like to share about the uh, first audio segment that you didn't have time for, uh, just make a note and we will make sure that you have time. This segment will be a little this episode this week will be a little longer than our typical episode again just because we're wrapping the book up today so we don't have a tiny section next week so we can move forward to a new book next friday harriet a washington's just magnificent work super important i hope folks share this widely with as many people as possible medical apartheid this is the epilogue context of white supremacy epilogue Medical Research with Blacks Today The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. The Nuremberg Code In this book, I have traced the long, unhappy history of medical research with black Americans. I have detailed how blacks have been convenient, powerless, maligned, and abused subjects of profitable medical research and also how their treatment has changed over the years. Slaves were physically forced into painful medical bondage. Their bodies were forced onto the stage of medical experiments to lend credence to claims of black inferiority and difference. And black bodies were even conscripted for anatomical dissection after death. Blacks were made subjects of experimentation that served to denigrate their intelligence or to provide distorted justifications for their enslavement. The reproductive rights of blacks also have been subjugated, via fraudulent research up to the present day. Groups of vulnerable blacks, including children, soldiers, and prisoners, have been consistently targeted. Both the federal government and private corporations have devised large-scale research abuses that range from radiation experiments to biological weapons development. This medical ill-usage has not strictly paralleled scientific knowledge. Rather, it has mirrored the larger American cultural beliefs as well as politics and economic trends. Once, black Americans enjoyed the sparsest of legal and social protections, nearly universal abject poverty, and few health care options. But this social and legal landscape has changed dramatically, and so have research practices. Where we are today. Today, the worst abuses are mostly memories, although some forms of abusive research persist, and a few new issues have arisen. However, today's offenses pale beside those our forebears survived. Today, much medical research is more than safe for African Americans, It is necessary. This may seem a strange message for a book that has described so many racial research abuses, but this volume's frankness is an essential prerequisite for asking African Americans to consider participating in medical research. No one can dismiss blacks' historically grounded fear of research and retain any credibility. We must acknowledge the past in order to regain trust and to seize the future. But medical abuse is more than historical fact. Although less rife, it remains a contemporary reality and an ever-present possibility. 
The challenge is to prepare the way for a new openness to medical research on the part of African Americans while maximizing their protections from abuse. I do not see how this can be accomplished without candor, because the traditional strategy of ostrich-like denial merely heightens mistrust. To gain trust, we must first acknowledge the flagrant abuses of the past and the subtler ones of the present. Yet much of the popular argument around medical experimentation and African Americans is dictated by culture and politics, not historical fact. The scientific camp includes most physicians, medical researchers, and others of racial groups who pride themselves upon their educational sophistication. They tend to deny all present research dangers and most past ones. Dismissing fears as emanating from those who are uneducated about the legal protections governing research, or so credulous as to believe unsubstantiated rumors about the medical targeting of blacks, mainstream medical scientists, journals, and even some news media fail to evaluate these fears in the light of historical and scientific fact, and tend instead to dismiss all such doubts and fears as anti-science. The potentially damping effects on medical research, not the facts, become the focus of most discussions of troubled experiments. Like the medical school professor whose horror at my choice of topics I described in the introduction, many claim that any acknowledgement of abuse will drive African Americans from sorely needed medical care. However, a steady course of lies and exploitation has already done this. A 2002 American Journal of Law and Medicine article estimated that as many as 20 million Americans have enrolled in formal biomedical studies, but fewer than one percent are African American. Yet the focus on African American fears is misplaced. A January 2006 Public Library of Science study entitled "Are Racial and Ethnic Minorities Less Willing to Participate in Health Research?" Examined the consent rates of 20 research studies that reported consent rates by race or ethnicity for more than 70,000 individuals. It found only slightly lower consent rates for blacks compared to non-Hispanic whites. The investigations ranged from interviews to drug treatments to surgical trials. Yet blacks are significantly less likely to be included in clinical trials, which suggests. That some factor other than consent is implicated. Studies such as those mentioned in Chapter 11 already show that black children are more likely to be used in non-therapeutic, harmful studies than in therapeutic investigations. Future research may document that this is true for black adults as well. In short, many scholars, such as Tuskegee Bioethics Center Director Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble, Aver that the true focus should not be on the aversion of black subjects, but rather on the untrustworthiness of American medical research when it comes to studies involving blacks. This book certainly documents this ethical deficiency. Although the focus of this book is clearly on experimental abuses of a vulnerable population, I do not want to leave the impression that I am advising people to avoid potentially beneficial medical experimentation. Quite the contrary, African Americans desperately need the medical advantages and revelations that only ethical, essentially therapeutic research initiatives can give them. The reticence of African Americans is the reasonable and understandable result of a horrendous history, but it lags behind progress. African American absence from research reflects the realities of yesterday, not today. More to the point. This aversion is a reaction Black Americans can ill afford. For this book to have the most value, I ask listeners to hold two seemingly contradictory but actually complementary facts in mind. The first is that African Americans must welcome and embark upon medical research as a bridge to fording the gulf that yawns between the health profiles of sickly and franchised Blacks. And those of healthy, long-lived whites. The second fact is that African Americans must remain wary of research abuses. They are rarer, 
but the potential for exploitation and abuse still looms. Physicians, patients, and ethicists must also understand that acknowledging abuse and encouraging African Americans to participate in medical research are compatible goals. History and today's deplorable African American health profile tell us clearly that black Americans need both more research and more vigilance. The worst abuses no longer occur, and others are becoming far rarer, in part because the media exposure of racial research scandals has led to public condemnation. This, in turn, has helped to support the enactment of stiffer laws carrying real penalties rather than yesterday's toothless codes, such as that written at Nuremberg. This matrix of legislation is not perfect, but it reduces the unabashed use of African Americans as duped or unwitting research subjects. Socio-political changes have also helped in this regard. There are no more separate but equal hospitals to provide powerless research fodder. There are no more nakedly vulnerable black people without the protection of the law. There are no more hospitals devoid of those black physicians who can protest racial dichotomies in patient treatment. Black physicians, researchers, and journalists now join the white professionals of conscience who have brought such abuses to attention and to a stop. The news media may not always discern and detail the patterns underlying problems with new therapies, but they do regularly expose research abuses. The government has shown itself more likely to close down entire university research programs under the aegis of the FDA when embarrassed by federally sponsored abuse. Closure is a fate that has been suffered by even premier universities, from Duke to Johns Hopkins. Most universities have heeded the message. All this amounts to a limited but real success story. African Americans are no longer the primary targets of research, exploitation, and abuse. Research ethics and policies have evolved to the point where the worst abuses of blacks are but a bad memory. That's the good news. Africa. Continent of Subjects. The bad news is that the racial mythology, the medical exploitation of black bodies for profit, and even the instances of medical sadism that threatened African Americans in the past have been exported to Africa. The recent history of medical research in Africa parallels closely that of African Americans in the United States a century ago. Colonialism and its residual racial and class separations have isolated blacks in hospitals or hospital wards away from whites, just as segregated hospitals once provided exclusively black subjects for white doctors. Laws that offered few or no protections for abused blacks have emboldened unscrupulous physicians and researchers who put curiosity and profits above the rights and welfare of their black patients. Western physicians, scientists, and pharmaceutical companies need large pools of people for Phase I trials, and they have swarmed Africa as they once flocked to prisons. U.S. researchers, who can no longer conduct trials at home without intense scrutiny from the FDA and the news media, have moved their operations to sub-Saharan Africa to exploit the public health vacuum that once condemned black Americans. To get around consent forms and a skeptical public, many researchers are turning their attention to African and other developing countries. Robert F. Murray, Jr., M.D., chief of the Division of Medical Genetics at Howard University, has observed. I would say the greatest chance for injury is in the third world, where people don't even know research is going on and don't have a clue. The long history of how Western investigators have taken their more questionable research initiatives to Africa is well documented in works such as Dr. Wolfgang U. Eckert's Medicine und Colonial Imperialismus. In it, Eckert details how, in a ghastly dress rehearsal for Dachau, 19th century German scientists conducted genocidal experiments on Africans, especially the Herero of Namibia. The United States, like Europe, has long used its non-white colonies and territories as its laboratories. 
For example, Richard Strong, M.D., used prisoners in the Philippines to conduct deadly malarial experiments. And Chapter 8 relates how Brazilian, Mexican, and Puerto Rican women have more recently been used for birth control trials that maimed and killed many. Warwick Anderson, M.D., documents how colonizing nations, including the United States, have used often mythical racial differences, including the purported infectious disease immunities of Africans, to further colonial aims and to justify the use of natives as workers in dangerous environments, just as U.S. slave owners once did. In much of Africa, Asia, and South America, a wide understanding has reigned that ethical rules governing medical experimentation were not for natives. Henry Louis Gates, chairman of African American Studies at Harvard University, recalls encountering such persistent racial myths during his undergraduate studies. I was pre-med at Yale and took a year off to work at a mission hospital in Tanzania, where the doctors were all Australians. I was only 21 years old, and I gave anesthesia to patients. I was shocked by the fact that when patients were writhing in pain, the doctors would say, they don't experience pain the same way we do. I was totally disgusted. I complained loudly and called them all racists, of course. But this illustrates how it is always easier to distance oneself from the pain of the other. The use of poor people of color abroad by American scientists today enables researchers to escape both the strictest scrutiny of institutional review boards and the gaze of the FDA, says Murray, who issued a prescient warning in 1994. People are going overseas trying to do research in Africa. They are saying, we don't have to go through all that IRB stuff to study AIDS, sickle cell, and other diseases. This sort of questionable research is now going on in Africa and third world countries because there are plentiful patients, and the scientists are not subject to the same restrictions they are now subjected to here. The third world has become the laboratory of the West, and Africans have become the subjects of novel, dangerous therapeutics. In 2002, the hormones of Bushmen were mined for potential weight loss therapies. Human growth factor was tested on pygmies before being used on Western children. And Depo Provera, although a carcinogen, was tested on Zimbabwean women before it was introduced into the United States as a reproductive injection. American firms tested artificial blood on unsuspecting black South African hospital patients, at the cost of at least 20 deaths. Harvard tested HIV therapies through research that would have violated ethical requirements for Americans. Some of the research on Africans by Western scientists has been more subtle but equally troubling from an ethical perspective. For example, trypanosomiasis, or sleeping sickness, kills as many as half those it infects in the Central African regions of Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Ethiopia, Malawi, and Tanzania. Malersoprol, the only effective treatment, is a very toxic compound of arsenic and antifreeze that kills one in five people who take it. By 1995, the pharmaceutical firm Aventis had completed research demonstrating that its drug aflornithine was effective against sleeping sickness, although not against cancer, as the firm had hoped. But the company decided to abandon its use against trypanomyosis due to high production costs and low profits. It began seeking other profitable uses for the drug, and U.S. researchers soon found one. Eflornithine effectively banished facial hirsutism in women. Aventus and later Bristol Myers Squibb began marketing the drug as Vanica because many American women were able to part with $50 a month to keep their faces free of hair, while few Africans were able to pay $50 monthly to save their lives. It is completely understandable that the firm should focus its resources upon the profitable depilatory use of their medication. 
but it is disappointing that it chose not to make the drug available cheaply to Africans in order to vanquish sleeping sickness. Doctors Without Borders forged a coalition, which included Bristol Myers Squibb, Bayer, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to provide drugs to Africans through 2006. But although sleeping sickness threatens 60 million people, only 7% of these have access to adequate medical treatment. Medications considered far too dangerous or too hopelessly tainted for testing in the West have been introduced into clinical trials with unsuspecting African patients. Within the past decade, even the infamously teratogenic drug thalidomide has been tried on Africans as a treatment for leprosy, 40 years after it produced 12,000 horribly deformed babies around the world. FDA researcher Francis O. Kelsey, M.D., refused to approve thalidomide as a treatment for morning sickness in the 1950s because she determined that clinical trials did not demonstrate its safety. Her caution saved most American infants the fate suffered by English and Europeans whose mothers took the drug. Only those U.S. babies whose mothers received thalidomide samples from their physicians were affected. But Third World Women subjects of thalidomide trials for leprosy and AIDS were not warned of the horrible birth defects the drug can cause. African experimental subjects, like the slaves of antebellum America, are legally vulnerable, relatively powerless, and racially distinct. Like black Americans after the Civil War, Africans' poor health and vanished health care infrastructure make it easier to pass off non-therapeutic research as medical therapy or to impose participation in research as a condition for therapy. The U.S. physician researchers who descend upon Africa in search of subjects frequently characterize their work as therapy, offering experimental solutions for medical disasters. When physicians offer Africans the same therapeutics they offer Westerners, they can lay claim to unalloyed beneficence. But the Western standard of care is not being offered. Usually, poor black Africans with no access to medical attention are offered treatments that are new or untried. Sometimes, U.S. researchers appear in the midst of an epidemic against which the stricken Africans have no medication and offer experimental treatment. During the height of a 1996 meningococcal meningitis epidemic, for example, scientists offered Pfizer's experimental drug, Troven, Floxacin, to terrified parents in Kano, Nigeria. Nigerians, desperate for medical attention, grasped at Troven's straw. By the time the experiment ended, 200 children were left severely disabled and 11 were dead. In 2001, at least 211 Nigerian parents sued New York-based Pfizer, Inc., alleging that non-FDA-approved experiments had killed or injured their children, that Pfizer failed to obtain the requisite approval from local leaders, and that the pharmaceutical giant failed to administer standard therapies with proven efficacy, such as Pfizer's own ceftriaxone, to those children who continue to deteriorate after being given Trovan. Peter Ibigbo of Child Rights Africa told Interpress Service, Our leaders must not allow Nigerians to be used as guinea pigs by any company to make money. Pfizer counters that it treated 90 children with Trovan and 97 with ceftriaxone and that it obtained all the necessary approvals. However, Dr. Sadiq Wali, Chief Medical Director of the Amino Kanu Teaching Hospital, says the hospital's medical ethics committee never gave Pfizer the required approval to use the drug at the infectious disease hospital in Kano. Pfizer did not do that. I am not sure if they had the consent of the people used as guinea pigs, because that means informed consent in medical parlance. Such consent has to do with the patients being told the good as well as the side effects of the drugs to be administered, said Dr. Wali. But documenting Trovan's effects on these patients for the lawsuit would prove tricky. The medical records of 350 meningitis patients treated between April and June 1996 have disappeared from the hospital.
The dearth of health care in much of Africa and the Third World makes its peoples vulnerable to experimental abuse. One cannot generalize about a continent as large and diverse as Africa. There are wealthy countries as well as poor ones, and a few health-savvy nations, such as Cameroon, could teach us a thing or two about providing health care to all our citizens. But much of sub-Saharan Africa has been devastated by colonial rape and depletion. These have left poor health, a ravaged health care infrastructure, and few physicians in their wake. A mere 750,000 health workers care for the continent's 682 million people. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that this represents a health care force that is as much as 15 times lower than in OECD countries. Only 1.3% of the world's health workers practice in sub-Saharan Africa, but the region harbors fully 25% of the world's disease. A bare minimum of 2.5 health workers is needed for every 1,000 people, but only six African countries meet this standard. Instead, the average in sub-Saharan Africa is 0.8 health workers per 1,000 people, less than one-third the minimal standard. To achieve the minimum health care staffing level will require an infusion of one million health workers into the continent. Safe devices are as scarce as doctors. Reused SUDs, single-use devices, and unsterilized needles help to spread AIDS and other infectious illnesses throughout Africa. The medically damaging injection practices and use of ethically suspect research has fomented a loss of trust in vaccines in Nigeria. Much of the news coverage focuses upon the contentions by suspicious Africans that the administration of Western vaccines spreads HIV and causes sterility. But no matter whether these fears are correct or imaginary, the practical result is unambiguous. Suspicious patients avoid care, and this iatrophobia means that conquer diseases, such as polio, are seeing a resurgence on the continent. A burgeoning research culture is thriving in the midst of this desultory public health activity and therapeutic vacuum. While the continent's wounds go unbound, research is big business in Africa. Seventy billion dollars is spent each year on medical research, but only 10% is devoted to diseases that cause 90% of the global health burden. This dichotomy provides an incubator for research abuses. Surrounded by pain, death, and infection, desperate, medically ignored Africans are confronted with a Hobson's choice, experimental medicine or no medicine at all. Western researchers who conduct investigations in the third world are supposed to elicit the approval of their home medical institutions. For example, most university policies align with FDA regulations that require treatments given to the control group members must be the standard of care for the treatment of the illness. Thus, if one wanted to test Trovan in Connecticut, the protocol or research plan would stipulate that researchers must give the control group the best drugs known to treat meningitis, a drug such as ceftriaxone. Under some conditions, generally when no effective treatment for a condition exists, control group members receive a placebo, an inert substance or a sham technique that does not offer any intrinsic therapeutic value, but allows scientists to compare results between a treated and an untreated group. But placebo studies, which are falling out of favor in the West, are completely inappropriate for serious diseases for which effective treatment exists. You cannot ethically justify withholding, for example, an efficacious drug such as AZT from HIV-positive people or people at high risk of contracting HIV just to determine whether protease inhibitors work better than nothing. You must give the tested group protease inhibitors, and the control group, either AZT or the best-known standard therapy. Tossing the people in the control group placebos, vitamins, or antibiotics would doom the control group, 
and so would be an unacceptable ethical breach, at least in the West. However, American IRBs treat Africans as second-class subjects and employ different standards for evaluating study designs in Africa than those used in the United States. Requiring evidence that the drug being administered meets or exceeds the standard of medical care is de rigueur for Western trials. But university IRBs now employ an ethical sleight of hand to stipulate that the tested drug must meet or exceed the standard of care in the country where the study is being evaluated. In impoverished, medically underserved sub-Saharan African countries, that standard of care has historically tended to be nothing. Americans who conduct research in African venues are supposed to seek the consent of their subjects. But this has never been a popular move, as the exasperated 1964 complaint of Dr. Francis D. Moore, a Harvard surgeon whose photograph had graced the cover of Time a year earlier, illustrates. Several years ago, an individual from this country went to Nigeria to try out a new measles vaccine on a lot of small children. Now, how exactly are you going to explain to a black African jungle mother the fact that measles vaccine occasionally produces encephalitis, but that more important than that, it might sensitize the child for the rest of his life to some other protein in the vaccine? We know now that any sort of immune response excites cross-reactions. For example, if a person develops a heightened immune reaction to some specific antigen, such as typhoid, he will be found to have other high titers against nonspecific antigens at the same time. In fact, there is a suspicion that some of the so-called autoimmune diseases are aroused by exposure of the reticuloendothelial system to completely different antigens. The possibility therefore arises that measles vaccines apply to thousands and thousands of children might excite in some of them such diseases as thyroiditis and ulcerative colitis. Can you imagine trying to explain that to a jungle mother? One of the greatest assets of a good doctor is the ability to look a patient in the eye and have the patient go along with him on a hazardous course of treatment. The same quality is exhibited by a medical experimenter when he looks at a patient and says that he thinks everything is all right. Moore avoided the troublesome task of individual disclosure and consent, and so do many researchers in Africa today, who do not want to take the time to translate their proposal into the local language and culture. They do not want to explain to hundreds or thousands of subjects such risks as iatrogenic encephalitis and sensitization, concepts that would have been as murky to a Connecticut homemaker in 1964 as they were to Moore's jungle mother. These scientists do not want to risk having the subjects reject their experiment once they understand the possible health costs. Neither do they especially want to explain why they are testing a new therapeutic approach to HIV thousands of miles away from the millions of cases in their own country. Moore doesn't mention this sort of question in his tirade against informed consent, but I suspect that it is the more difficult of the questions his jungle mother might put to him today. The Erosion of Consent Unlike the disastrous Third World research trends, medical research with black Americans has lost so much of its historically abusive nature that black Americans should embrace new medical research. After judicious inquiries of their own into any study they are considering. But there are still issues that must be addressed. And until these problems are rectified, black Americans must embrace medical research warily. These issues include the recent erosion of informed consent, the need for better quality research into black health issues, the overemphasis upon genetic research in non-genetic issues, and the government's distortion of research with black Americans to further political and ideological ends. It is the most fundamental tenet of medical ethics and human decency that the subjects volunteer for the experiment after being informed of its nature and hazards. This is the clear dividing line between criminal and what may be non-criminal. 
If the experimental subjects cannot be said to have volunteered, then the inquiry need proceed no further. So testified Andrew Ivey, M.D., chief witness for the prosecution in the Nuremberg doctor's trial. The Nuremberg Code was instituted in August 1947 by Americans judging 23 physicians and scientists to ensure that the horrors of abusive medical experimentation never again be visited upon the world. Its very first line is unambiguous. The consent of the subject is absolutely essential. But American research culture increasingly disagrees. In October 1996, the Department of Health and Human Services passed 21 CFR 50.24, a regulation that robbed seriously ill emergency room patients of the right to informed consent. This allows researchers to legally enroll such patients in medical research studies and test experimental therapies on them without their consent. The emergency room deaths began the very next year, on April 1, 1997, when the Occupational Health and Hygiene Plan, OHHP, suspended a U.S. clinical trial that had enrolled unwitting patients in a clinical trial of diasporin cross-linked hemoglobin, DCLHB, for treating shock. So many more people who received the experimental treatment died than those receiving standard care that the trial had to be stopped early. These people had never given their consent to participate in the study that killed them. Yet today, the practice of experimenting with non-consenting emergency room patients continues. For example, when they need a blood transfusion, unconscious patients brought into some emergency rooms are as likely to be given an artificial substitute as blood, without their knowledge. Also, the Abiocor company proposes to implant their complication-ridden model of a self-contained artificial heart into a wide variety of heart attack patients who are brought into emergency rooms if they meet certain, rather wide, research criteria, again, without their permission or knowledge. And informed consent is also being attacked more insidiously in assaults upon existing laws. Various ethicists who are experts in human medical experimentation, such as J. Katz, M.D., and George Annis, J.D., worry that the vague language of federal regulations governing human medical experimentation is being interpreted in a manner that minimizes protections. At the same time, they point out addenda to these regulations that further curtail patient protection and patient autonomy while expanding the types and number of people who can become subjects. The erosion of consent is often presented as a partial surrender or a compromise between the needs of researchers for subjects and a small loss to a patient autonomy. Or it is presented behind the mask of futility. In such scenarios, it is argued, the patient is unconscious and cannot agree or disagree to partaking of a possibly life-saving experimental treatment, so his doctors should decide for him. In such cases, research is conflated with treatment to justify removing informed consent from the equation. But these scenarios are false and misleading. It is not necessary to waive informed consent in order to provide the unconscious with treatment. Laws already exist that permit doctors to offer the best available treatment to patients who are comatose, unconscious, under age, or in other ways unable to consent to treatment. But these laws do not extend to experimentation, and rightly so. Treatment focuses upon the patient's needs. Experimentation focuses upon the researcher's needs. No matter how much those researchers may invoke possible or future benefits for patients. In fact, these studies are typically randomized, which means that the computer, not the doctor, determines which experimental therapy will be administered. This may not be the best treatment for the patient, nor the therapy the patient would choose. Once one loses the right to be told what one is about to undergo, to agree or to refuse participation, Research policy gains momentum on a very slippery slope. 
This book documents the depths to which researchers have stooped to bypass the consent of the subject. In fact, African Americans first became favored subjects because during the antebellum period they did not enjoy legal protections, and researchers did not need their consent. This vulnerability also persists today in other settings where blacks are overrepresented, such as military ground troops. In 1990, the Department of Defense (DoD) sought and obtained from the Food and Drug Administration a waiver of the informed consent requirements for human medical experimentation. Under Rule 21 CFR 50.23d, soldiers suddenly lost the protection of the informed consent provisions that give other Americans the right to say no to experimental medications. The DoD forced them to accept experimental drugs, including pyridostigmine bromide, a putative prophylactic against nerve gas attack, and the pentavalent botulinum toxoid vaccine for botulism. In 1998, with FDA permission, the DoD anthrax vaccination immunization program (AVIP) also began immunizing 2.4 million soldiers against the potential threat of airborne anthrax. At least 900,000 troops have been immunized to date. But, citing devastating side effects and deaths that have been validated by amendments to the medication warning labels. Hundreds of soldiers have refused to comply, at least 100 of whom have been court-martialed, and many have been forced to leave the military. One of these was Jamikia Barber, who, while stationed in Colorado, was ordered to accept an anthrax vaccination in preparation for a transfer to Korea. She disobeyed that order on the grounds that the vaccination may not be safe for females of childbearing age. Black soldiers, such as Barber, are twice as common in ground troops as in American society, and so are especially vulnerable to measures such as forced vaccinations. In late 2003, Judge Emmett G. Sullivan of the United States District Court in Washington, D.C., noted that the Supreme Court had ruled that U.S. combat troops could no longer be compelled to take the experimental anthrax vaccinations. The FDA responded by rapidly elevating the anthrax vaccine from a questionable investigational drug to an approved therapeutic, allowing the DoD to sidestep the intent of the law and restoring the soldiers to a state of investigative servitude. Investigative, because the data collection and evaluation of the anthrax vaccine risks, including death, will continue among soldiers. Fortunately, in 2004, Judge Sullivan ordered the DoD to stop forcing anthrax vaccines on U.S. military personnel. Barber's lawsuit against the Army continues. Today, African Americans are at greater risks than whites of being conscripted into such research without giving their consent, because blacks are more likely than whites to receive their health care from emergency rooms. However. This coin of research vulnerability has an obverse. We also need more and better research into black healthcare. Such high-quality research has begun to emerge, but as Chapter 14 points out, it has also taken some wrong turns. For example, research into black ailments and medications, such as that conducted in support of the black heart failure drug Bidil. Is sometimes sloppy and illogical, and in other cases, it is based on the thinnest of premises. The long history of flawed science in the service of preconceived notions is being supplemented by new, insufficiently questioned racial theories of disease. Adopting these unquestioningly, while ignoring important environmental disease factors, not only imperils black health. It also reinforces the idea of blacks as possessing dramatic physiological differences. The inclusion of blacks in quality American medical research is also important for everyone. Why? Many arguments cite the dollar savings or the reduction in disease exposure to the larger society that will emanate from better health care among African Americans. However. 
I am often uncomfortable with arguments that focus solely on utility, especially when it comes to medicine and health. Such benefits can be elusive or hard to quantify. I believe that caring for people and maximizing their chances at health and happiness are goals that we should pursue for their own sake, because they are the right thing to do. They elevate us spiritually and socially and reaffirm our cohesion and our humanity. But that said, there is no denying that increasing the ethical, reasonably safe research available to African Americans will benefit everyone else. This book has repeatedly demonstrated how the poor health profile spawned by experimental abuse has not only harmed blacks, but has spilled over to harm their white compatriots. Pathogens, for instance, are notoriously democratic. Had African Americans not been excluded from early AZT therapy on the basis of flawed HIV treatment clinical trials that largely excluded them, would the number of HIV-infected African Americans be lower today? Would the number of all domestic AIDS cases be lower, considering that black Americans today constitute half of all the HIV-infected? It's too late to know now, but not too late to do better racial recruitment for the next HIV clinical trials. The fallout extends beyond infectious disease. For example, Donna Christian Christensen, M.D., who represents the U.S. Virgin Islands in Congress, has observed that the percentage of black Americans who are insured is lower than that of white Americans, and the cost of caring for these uninsured people raises the rates and health care costs of all Americans. She said, We're getting to the hospital late, using much more expensive care. We're really driving up the costs of health care. In fact, a decade ago, research by Harvard School of Public Health Professors Ichiro Kawachi, M.D., and Deborah prothro Stith, M.D., explained this public health phenomenon in detail and even quantified it, emerging with what was popularly referred to as the Robin Hood Index. The shorthand is that public health suffers more in the nations with the greatest inequities in wealth, and that the middle class suffers nearly as much as the poorer from inequities. In the United States, which has, for example, one of the world's greatest disparities in income between the haves and the have-nots, we have not only the greatest health disparities, but the greatest health cost burdens for the mostly white middle class. In short, whites should care about quality medical research for African Americans because its dearth has generated needless pain, suffering, anger, and costs that continue to permeate the fabric of our entire nation. It is not only a racial tragedy, but also an American tragedy. For their part, African Americans cannot afford passivity. Seneca said, It is part of the cure to wish to be cured. When it comes to medical research, that wish must be awakened in African Americans. African Americans should not shun life-saving research. Indeed, they cannot afford to do so. Instead, they must carefully scrutinize research initiatives before becoming subjects. But we must do more. We must also address the dearth of therapeutic research in areas that affect the health of African Americans most dramatically. What changes are necessary to achieve this? Repair the System of Institutional Review Boards, IRBs. IRBs judge the scientific and ethical acceptability of proposed studies on human subjects. However, a string of abusive experiments have revealed that the nation's 5,000 IRBs have failed to perform their role of protecting the public, and African Americans in particular. In June 1998, a Department of Health and Human Services HHS report concluded that IRB staff are inadequately trained, subject to conflicts of interest, and overwhelmed by too many cases. The Office of Protection from Research Risks, OPRR, requires IRBs to have a minimum of five members, at least one of whom must have primarily scientific interests, 
another of whom must have primarily non-scientific interests, and another of whom must be otherwise unaffiliated with the IRB's institution. But most IRB members are scientists affiliated with the organization in question, and even the lay members tend to have loyalties to the home institution. I propose that each IRB be composed of equal numbers of scientists and peers of the group who will be asked to participate as subjects. Some may object that lay people will be unable to understand enough about scientific experiments to judge their suitability and value. But as a medical communicator, I doubt this. I know many skilled and motivated scientists who routinely convey complex information to many people, although to do so may require some preparation and effort. Moreover, if a project cannot be explained to laypersons in an IRB meeting, how does a researcher propose to explain it to the potential subjects, as he must do by law? I also propose that each IRB include a medical ethicist and, if possible, a medical historian. Stop the erosion of consent. Ban exceptions to informed consent. Recognize the right of every patient to say yes or no as an absolute value and cease designating groups such as soldiers, unconscious emergency room patients, and third world experimental subjects as appropriate subjects without their input. When physicians are faced with a patient who is unable to consent because of his or her medical condition and whose condition requires treatment before a family member or other proxy can be consulted, I propose that the patient be treated as if the physician had no research protocol to worry about. Treat him or her, but don't enroll that patient in a study. Instead, use the best known treatment for that particular individual. Institute a Coordinated System of Mandatory Subject Education The NIH and the Office of Research Integrity require that every practicing medical researcher receive education in the ethical and practical conduct of biomedical research. I took such a course at Harvard Medical School in 2004 and found it factually invaluable and culturally revealing. I propose that prospective research subjects be given the same advantage. Every institution that receives government funds to perform research should be required to hold approximately three classes that equip subjects with information about how research is conducted, what risks and benefits are inherent in different types of research, what their legal rights and moral responsibilities are, what sort of questions they should ask, and how they can maximize their chances of getting the desired result from the clinical trial they enter. Except for seriously ill or otherwise incapacitated patients, only people who have completed this course should be eligible to participate in government-funded clinical trials, and only they should be permitted to serve on IRBs. Embrace a single standard of research ethics. We cannot retain moral credibility if we champion human rights in medical research at home and ignore them abroad. Researchers should be made to follow informed consent strictures abroad that are as restrictive as those governing their research on American shores. Pharmaceutical companies should be forced to make life-saving drugs available to people in poor countries, even when this means sacrificing their obese profits for the benefit of human welfare. Because the federal government sponsors much of the research that enables pharmaceutical companies to develop vital medications, the federal government should take advantage of its legal right either to force manufacturers to lower their prices or to suspend patent enforcement in poor countries. However, more important than any of the above recommendations is the need for African Americans to set their own research agendas. Black patients must take ownership of medical research issues, as they have done with so many other complex health issues, from AIDS to environmental racism. Already, expert medical organizations have taken leadership roles. The National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University provides not only a center for scholars, 
but also a venue for much-needed lay education on medical research. The National Medical Association has also spearheaded patient education through its project IMPACT, which has helped black Americans to navigate clinical trials safely by providing brochures, websites, and access to experts. African American and other health organizations must continue and expand the work of these pivotal groups. And much of this can be done close to home, through church health fairs, social organizations, and community activism. I challenge African Americans to bring medical research education to the fore of the American health agenda. I challenge you, the reader, to familiarize yourself with the informational documents on this book's website and elsewhere, to join an IRB, to ask the hard questions of physicians who are recruiting in your community, and to join appropriate clinical trials once you have satisfied yourself that they are worthwhile and relatively safe. I challenge African Americans to effect a transformation of our attitudes toward medical research and to demand our place at the table to enjoy the rich bounty of the American medical system in the form of longer, healthier lives. I challenge us to change, because, as Charles Darwin once observed, it is not the strongest species that will survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. This concludes Medical Apartheid by Harriet A. Washington. Narrated by Ron Butler. And that will do it. That was a great decision to just finish up this week as opposed to doing some little piddling. Uh, it would have been about a 20-minute or a 30-minute section uh, next week, unless everybody died uh, and fell asleep or what have you while we were uh, doing the epilogue. We are all done. Medical Apartheid, again, one of the uh, best five books uh, that I have read easily. Uh, should maybe even be in the top three just a phenomenal read and again glad we were able to read it together the number to dial if you have uh concluding comments things that stood out from the epilogue or major themes points that you will take away from this book if uh you were trying to share with someone else and tell them to read this book like what the the one thing that stuck out with you most that you thought was most important that she'll be like hey you got to read this book because of this point specifically uh, or something that you did not know that you learned or whatever was most profound uh, for you in terms of things that you'll take from this book let's uh, kind of get our concluding thoughts together as we wrap it up with Harriet A. Washington's Medical Apartheid and again she does have other books if you want to continue to check out some of her other uh, outstanding scholarship Uh, the number to dial is 641-715-3600 Four zero, the code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Number again six four one seven one five three six four zero. Code five six four nine four three pound. Uh, let us not lollygag and wait until the last minute. If you know there are things you would like to share. Uh, that have stood out. If you didn't get to share during the first audio segment after we uh, conversed, uh, get your hand up now. We'll make time, make sure everybody gets to share whatever you want to make sure you get in uh, as we wrap up with medical apartheid. All the folks who dialed in uh, who have a hand up should be with us. And uh, I guess we'll start with the people that we did not hear from the first time around. Uh, Our female caller in Michigan, did you have commentary you wanted to share? Have you heard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, Gus, and to the callers. I have um, been listening to uh, reading the book and uh, checking out some of the uh, archives because I haven't been able to participate as I would have liked to um, every week. But this book has literally broken my heart. Um, I, I'm just glad that I, I read it. Um, as hard as it has been for me to just get through each chapter, um, is something that, um, as a parent and just as a black person on the planet, um, it just keeps me mindful of, of the fact that white people are experimenting on black people. 
Um, as I get older and um, I, I'm just more mindful of my health and um, just the things that I am doing to uh, stay healthy and understand that any oppor- just the, the, just going to the doctor and and dealing with uh, people in the medical profession, um, they just can't be trusted. And this book really sheds light on that. Um, I just remember um, dealing with my grandmother before she passed and how she really just, she she thought everything her doctor said was just, you know, golden. You know, it was just, she trusted everything they said. And um, she's no longer here. And I remember uh, they amputated both of her legs and she just wouldn't question what the doctor said and and luckily my sister and I we you know kind of watched over her as best we could but at that time we were younger so this book just just really sheds light on how important it is to um just not be blindly led and to stay as healthy as we can to research um and read as much as we can and um this book it's just been heartbreaking. It's just been heartbreaking, and I, I appreciate again just this this program. I appreciate the fact that had I not been a part of this program, I would have never stumbled across this book. So I'll make sure to um, share uh, share just this book and just try to spread the word about the good work that is happening on Friday night, especially with uh, reading. So. I just want to thank you and just say that um, it was difficult for me getting through this book. I am one of those type of people where um, this type of stuff really, like, it's, it's, it's hard. So I'm, I'm just trying to deal with the fact that this is a reality. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll mute my line. I just want to definitely chime in on uh, on this book. It was it was difficult. And so that's, that's all I'll, I'll say. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, the caller, retired firefighter in Florida. Uh, do you have commentary, sir? Uh, just wanted to say that any source that can organize your thoughts is very important. Uh, organizing your thoughts meaning to give you a give a person a clear a clear or a clearer understanding of of things so they can think speak and act in the most proficient manner is vital i think something like this this book is an example of that uh it becomes more in the same of the process of non-white people being mistreated, especially non-white people who are identified as black, on how you are being mistreated on a global basis in the most diabolically uh, organized manner. Uh, A lot of us have a lot of uh, thoughts in our minds this or I suspect that uh, books like this makes it makes it more clear for you to organize on what you're going to be saying and what you're going to be thinking and what and ultimately what you're going to do about a problem so uh, that's why reading is so important and even with that there are some sources that are called books that are more proficient and I would as I've heard you say, put this book up there high on the list of of uh, books that are most constructive because this particular uh, issue of mistreatment, the body itself, I mean, you can't get more fundamental than that. If you're going to control and or dominate a person you start off with their, with their own their, their their bodies, you know, uh, from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, 
And I mean, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to worry about that, that, that group. If you have that kind of control over them and even those of that, that group that's not even born yet, they already come into a, a, a situation to whereas you, 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 they have to come to you. They have to come to you for treatment. And in turn, you're going to mistreat them for the most part. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's my thoughts on, on uh, this particular source. Thank you for listening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the caller at 9516, did you have a uh, commentary this year? 9516? Yes, you heard. You're a little low. If you could speak up, please. Okay, is that there? A smidge. Okay. Um, I hope this is good. The volume is good. Um, just listening to this book, um, I just come to the conclusion again that you can uh, never trust white. I know she talked about um, regaining trust, but like, how can you trust? you know, people, you know, who have raised war against you. You know, she, you know, she tells us to, uh, you know, do research before we, that the research is important for us as African Americans, but it's like, you, you can't trust, you can't trust them. You know, the research, all of the research is in the book, all the evidence is in the, in the book. She, she put it there. So it's like, even though she's saying that we don't, so the laws are in the United States are more strict or whatever. They're not, uh, I guess, doing us as bad as they used to. It still, it still doesn't make a difference because they're still doing it. They still do. We don't, we don't. They doing it, and we don't know that they doing it. And if we even went to research, they're gonna lie to us anyway about what they're doing. So I mean, I would just say, just don't, don't trust white. At all, I don't know. I kind of think like, um, you know, she talks about you know African Americans um, having all kind of diseases and this and that, and uh, that they're you know that makes them you know they us being suspicious of uh, wanting to be experimented on. But I mean, it, it, it's logical for us to be suspicious, and I just believe that you know uh, we are sick uh, because of white supremacy. And that's all I have. Right on, right on. Uh, other folks, everybody else, I think we got all the people that we did not hear from during uh, the first segment where we exchanged views. Uh, all the other folks who dialed in uh, who are on the line should be with us. Uh, retired firefighter, uh, caller, female caller in Kansas, Roz, Thomas in New York, uh, Mr. Demery Ford, Tapello. Uh, you should all be with us if you have commentary you want to share as well. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, um yes, it's like I agree with what um the other two people said. This is definitely a very um you know, tough book. But um I would say this is uh by far the most informative book that we've read, uh, that I participated in the show with and um you know, I think my second favorite, you know, I think my favorite is on um, the Richard Williams book. Um, that was, you know, very good. Um, but, um, you know, this was um, definitely the most informative. And I think I, I definitely get the difference when um, um, the half never been told. And um, the Katrina book was both very informative, but they were written by white people. And you definitely saw the difference um, in the compassion she showed. Which, you know, you could tell that she she felt for these people. It wasn't like we did this and then we did that and then we did this. It was like, you know, this happened to us and that happened to us and this you could feel a big difference in the way it was written. And I really like that. And she did a very good job, I guess, in her position. Um, you know, she can't be you know, go too far over um being in the medical field, but um I think she did a good job. Um I think that number one thing I took from this book was um, under a system of racism and white supremacy, you know, I always knew that it was always going to be there, you know, but now I see that even when you die, um, they still got you. They're going to 
they experiment on your body, you can't get away from them. Um, they have so much power. This book is definitely a show on how much power they have um, to do what they do worldwide, experiment with people. You know, once they get too much pressure here, you know, you should set up shop in Africa. No one's going to pressure us there. You know, we'll experiment with this stuff with them, and you'll realize this works here, so we can just sell it here for this much, and they can't even afford it here, even though they were people that were experimented on. It's just um, just how the system works. Um, I, I would like to also say earlier in the first reading, I remember when we were in the Ebola um, crisis was first breaking out, and we were putting a lot of articles from that on the country swimming pool, and, and I, I had started researching it, and I said on the show that it seems to start from Marburg to you when you find out that, you know, way back then they were um, trying to um, militarize us or, or um, you know, make a, that Marburg disease into a biological agent. So I guess that's what ended up being Ebola. You know, you start to see on how some of this stuff played out over time. And I wouldn't be surprised if, they haven't put certain um, chemicals in our areas, um, deliberately causing a lot of the strife between black people. Um, that that's creating a lot of anti-blackness. Um, you know, I also heard that you know that blue light that is on the street light causes some um, mental thing. I mean, there's so many things. They've done so much experimentation. They're so proficient at doing what they do. I mean, they could be just spraying a little chemical that's just going to make you a little edge. You know, edge, you know, some stuff in your sneakers, you're ready to kill them. It's, you never know what, how they do things, and I'll meet my mom. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, yes, please to you, Gus. Um, I definitely want to echo the previous sentiment. This book was an extremely hard read, but I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, it's definitely in my top five. I put it up there with um, Psychopath Psychopathic Racial Personality by Dr. Bobby Wright, of course, the ISIS papers, um, uh, Urugu, and uh, Neely Fuller's work as well. It goes right up there with those. Um, I think it's one of the most important books that we could ever read. And now that I'm watching my in-laws go through the twilight stages of their lives, and I, I can now see the cumulative damage of what not knowing um, how the system works can do to your body as far as the way that they might have eaten and different things they might have done in their youth that contributed to the issues they're dealing with now as older people. And the many times I've seen my wife literally, like, break down um, watching her parents be severely mistreated by the medical system once we finally got our hands on their full medical records. We got to see a lot of the things that were done to them or a lot of the information that we weren't aware of and that they actually were hiding from us in certain instances. They weren't um, forthcoming with a lot of things. We had to learn a lot of stuff after they got sick. So one thing I learned is just the, the essential importance of trying to maintain your own health so you stay as far away from their hospitals and as far away from their medical torture systems as possible and also the importance of what Dr. or uh, Mrs. Uh, Professor Vanilla Randall talks about the ability of those family members who are not sick to protect or put some sort of protections on their family members who are in the medical system. I think that is just one of the most important things. That's something that um, listening to this show and listening to Dr. Vanilla Randall and Dr. Welsing and all the other um, uh, African doc um, um, black doctors and, and scholars that they discuss these things, I think that is such an essential thing, and I thank you so much for um, just the forethought on having programs of that nature. Um, there were a couple things I wanted to touch on. One was on page 374. There's a very brief section that says, Ford's expertise in the toxicology of everyday life was put to use as South African physicians busily set about eliminating the em enemies of apartheid. Now, this kind of just shows how the, the while they're creating agents of biological and chemical terror, for the destruction of black life. They're working in concert with actual so-called medical doctors whose sole purpose it was to actually put these destructive things to use. So it's such a cohesiveness in the system of white supremacy where all the different areas of people activity function on an optimal level to create the destruction of black life 
and I think that's something that we really need to maintain um, and a, a serious understanding of. Um, on page 380, she writes, however, one needs no legal expertise to wonder how Bassan would could be innocent when so many of his key lieutenants testified in detail and with consistency about the crimes they committed together. Bassan's innocent verdict had been predicted by news analysts based on the all-white courtroom players and the pro-Bassan bias of the judge. So Bassan was right to gamble that he would be convicted of no crime and serve no sentence. The judge, the barrister, the journalist, and the scientists, both South African and American, as well as the trial analysts, were all white leaving one to wonder who speaks for the black victims of Dr. Death. ANC official Smuts Ngonyama resorted to the understatement the justice system has let us down on this case. To me, this is like just a, 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 just a sad example of what we deal with every day. These creatures commit genocide with impunity, and they get away with it. And as long as they're together, as long as white people function as a racist superorganism, she named every aspect of the society essentially facilitating the exoneration of this psychopathic genocidal maniac. And this is the stuff we have to remain abreast of at all times. Um, lastly, she had a section on page 382 where she discusses the government literally facilitating the use of biological and chemical agents on unsuspecting U.S. citizens and the subway systems and things like that. Um, earlier this year, I found out that... Um, the U.S. government facilitated spraying of chemicals in New York City subways. I take the subway every day. They were using the vent system. I don't know what the chemicals were, but they were being utilized to see the effect on the citizens, how it affected the people in the train station. And, I mean, like, there's no place that's safe. You go outside your house, it's chemtrails. In the train station, they're spraying you with stuff you don't know what they're spraying you with. Um, I just don't think that there's any black people, I don't care if they die in their sleep with a smile on their face. I don't think there's, I don't care if they died a hundred. I don't think there's a black person since the system of white supremacy has started that has died of natural causes. I would say every black person that has died in this country has been murdered in some form or fashion or another. We are not living the optimum healthy life that we should expect to live due to the system and the holistic destruction that it creates. Um, I think this book is magnanimously important for people, for black people specifically, but all, all non-white people. Um, again, I thank you for this program. I thank you for, for reading these books. Um, and I think that's one of the most important aspects of the show that you, that you, uh, that you propagate is the, the importance of reading and also the types of material that you expose your mind to. This is one mind-changing, mind-altering uh, text, and I really want to read some of her other books because I think she did such impeccable research on this one. Again, thank you, Gus, for this book, and I thank all the other callers. You have facilitated my understanding, um, gave me a depth of understanding um, that facilitates my lying attitude in the protection of my in-laws and, the, and for, for that matter, all of my family members. Um, so I thank you all very much, and I'll meet my line. Ashe, Ashe. Uh, the caller at 0011, I don't think we heard from you. Uh, 0011, did you have commentary that you wanted to get in? Uh, yes, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, a magnificent show. Uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, I, I just, it, it's become more and more apparent to me, at, you know, as we deal with uh, societal issues that are all on the forefront, that the root of it is so biological, it's, it's, it's uh, not crazy, but it's mind-blowing, um, but that's the root of it. And it's, the more I study, it's become quite apparent to me that they've been studying us for a very, very long time biologically. Um, I think it would behoove us to study them like they study us. And I don't think that's the common thought uh, in most of black society. I, I had a father pass an Agent Orange, quote-unquote, 54 years old, um, very, very quickly. He was in the Vietnam, he was a Vietnam vet. And these were biological things, warfare that he carried in his body for years and years. Um, this book was, I, I got to go back and read it probably two or three times to really even um, absorb it. I understand why my elders <laughs> always been just very, very quick to not visit the doctor. They say you go in and you may not come out. Um, 
And I think all of us, it, w- it would be important, I know I've done this for several years, to make a point to learn how to take care of our own bodies, learn how to eat, to live. Um, Dr. Sebi, Dr. Africa, like these, these magnificent works they've put out um, that are very important for us as biological creatures on this planet um, to create a barrier for whatever they put out. Chemtrails, chemicals, this or that. I think there's something divine and biological within us, spiritually included, that they, quote unquote, know about um, that to erad- eradicate a lot of these things and make us somewhat potentially invincible. And I don't think enough of us know that. And I, I feel like th- those things would be um, really important for us to, to get our hands on and study um, whether it's we parrots alone, like eating, eat, eat, how we eat creates our body. Um, and uh, white people, as far as I'm concerned, aren't gods, but they show our planet smart. And we just got to get ahead of them. That's, that's all I have to say. I'll meet my wife. Always good to hear first time callers. Glad you could uh, participate, particularly on the book session. That is outstanding. Uh, I think there was a female caller you were going to participate. Uh, thought I heard before. Maybe I didn't. Uh, the caller at four seven five seven four seven five seven. Did you have commentary you wanted to share? Hello, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. In the first part of the last, there's first off, this reading has been amazing. Um, there's so many parts of this book that relate directly to me, but also to many people in my family. It's been in, just incredibly valuable. And I'm going to pass on the uh, archives to other people I know. Um, and there's a lot of things I could say about this book, but I'm going to try to limit it to two things, uh, particularly to the last part of the reading, because I'm actually short for one episode because I want to participate in the last episode. Um, in the first part of the last reading, I was surprised to hear about the mosquitoes. I think that's the insect that the government sent out, um, specifically the black areas. I, it's like you expect the white supremacists to come with the STDs, their you know, poisonous vaccines through the water supply, through the air supply, and the food. But I did not expect them to engineer animals for biological warfare. It kind of makes me look sideways at my cat coming in from the house, out from outside sometimes. I mean, what's to stop someone from, like, just sprinkling something on the cat and then it coming in the house. So it just kind of makes me look sideways at a lot of animals outside now, which is something I didn't think this reading would do. But um, the second point was I wanted to possibly offer more information on the, uh, I guess, Native American biological warfare with um, three particular incidents. One, uh, the intentional giving of the smallpox blankets to natives in the 1700s, which to me indicates that white people have been trying to do biological warfare on non-whites for at least 300 years. Um, two, the forced sterilization of thousands of Native American women as part of the eugenics process. This is, I think, early 1900s until at least the 1970s. Um, that's when the articles came out about it, at least. And then three, the uranium exposure of the Southwest Navajo, who was sent into the uranium mines um, without knowledge that it was radioactive. And the Navajo were sent into the uranium mines before the dust settled and before they allowed the white miners to even go in. And uh, I don't bring them up, by the way, to overshadow the absolute horrors that have been inflicted upon black people, but to point out how white people seem to always, always, always find someone non-white to just antagonize biologically everywhere. Um, just patterns of it. But um, that was that was all I have for now. Thank you so much for doing this reading. This was amazing. For sure. It has been a hoot. Um, any uh, other folks that we have not heard from, if you had commentary that you wanted to share, feel free, hand up. Meaning if uh, we haven't heard from you since the second audio segment began. Anything you wanted to get in? Yes, I have you heard. Yes, sir. Okay, yes. Uh, I think some of the things that uh, this last part, you know, she started to say that there's no more separate but equal hospitals to provide 
powerless research fodder. There are no more nakedly vulnerable black people without protection of the law. There's no more hospitals devoid of those black physicians who can protest racial dichotomies in patient treatment. <clears throat> you know, so in, at one point, she's saying that, you know, things may have been have gotten better. African Americans are no longer the primary targets of research, exploitation, and abuse. Research ethics and policies has evolved to the point where the worst abuses of blacks are but a bad memory. That's the good news. But I'm not aware of too much good news in a system of white supremacy. And then she goes on to tell us about how uh, they're even over in Africa now, experimenting without informed consent. And a lot of people don't even know what type of medical care that they're getting. And they're doing the same things that they did to us, you know, 50, 100 years ago. It's just going around again, the same thing. So, in a way, uh, things just still remain the same in the system of white supremacy. And she has some excellent suggestions. You know, it looks as though uh, people using the emergency room all the time is not a good idea. From what I've gathered, you need a personal physician that you visit. Doctors refer you to whatever your health care needs are. Don't just keep popping in the emergency rooms. No telling what's going to happen. And uh, have someone with you, you know, that will help you with these decisions. Uh, be questionable by all these vaccines and uh, immunizations. Uh, and... You know, she made a good point about the institutional review boards. If they can do some reform on those where there may be some beaker of hope that we're not experimented on and uh, given biological and chemical weapons that would cause our own uh, genocide. I mute my line. For sure, for sure. Uh, the person at 5782, 5782, did you have a uh, comment? I'm glad we had good participation throughout. We that, Make sure I get that in before our next caller shares. But we did have pretty solid participation from folks all the way throughout, which uh, is great. And it should have been that way because this was the book that people voted on way, way back at the end of 2015. And it was just a delay uh, in getting to this. But uh, we finally got it taken care of and glad on all accounts. Uh, the caller, last four digits, 5782. Did you have commentary? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Gus and everybody else. I'm a new caller. I've um, been listening, I uh, believe, for the past uh, three episodes. And I got that book today. I was um, able to follow and from Chapter 15. And I'm um, so uh, at all to this uh, country that I believe I had believed in when I um, I'm not a, I wasn't born here I really thought much about this country and to see the things that they did they did to my country too and they did to Mother Africa and um, when I uh, I just um you know, got hooked up on um, Christianity, and that was a blind. I studied uh, Christianity from uh, '84 and 2012. Avid Christian, and I went to a conference uh, in Orlando with. Uh, Ray Hagen and uh, 
I bought a, I bought a um, DVD there, How You Become a Christian, who passed it down to you from your, your parents who loved you so much they wouldn't lie to you. And I believe it and uh, spent many years in that book. And they say you um, you are not supposed to read any other book but that book, the Bible. And it's it it really blinds you because you can, you have no other perspective, nothing else to look at, nothing else to think of, nothing else to listen to or to gain ideas from. And from I got loose um, from that um, that burden was lifted on that day. I went to that conference in Orlando. A dear friend in, uh, introduced me to. Um, Ray Hagan, and um, then I, I listened to uh, um, Carl Nelson. I got away from uh, religion. Uh, and I, I the caller, uh, I just wanted to, to hop in. Uh, so I definitely appreciate first time callers. We had several of them today. That is awesome. Uh, we do try to uh, focus our commentary uh, on the book for the book club session. I'm not sure if you've heard those before as opposed to just uh, observations or our experiences or thoughts on other things. We really try and stay focused on the book specifically. Did you have any, any commentary you wanted to share on uh, the book Medical Apartheid, what we've been talking about today? Yeah, the book is what I've been to, but I'll, con- uh, you know, I'll, I'll um, shorten it up. The book is um, how uh, diseases, um, how you, 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 you uh, 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 a dear friend of mine came down with AIDS, and a young fella, I mean, strong fella, and uh, we couldn't believe how he got AIDS, and, you know, but anyhow, we was giving it uh, um, to him. Another thing, again, with um, the, 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 how they say AIDS uh, came about, is uh, the green monkey from Africa, and um, another friend of, uh, of a friend came down with AIDS again, and I just realized how uh, these uh, diseases come about. But I didn't get a chance to, uh, I just followed from chapter 15. So I have the book now, I have to go back and listen to the archives, and um, I am going to be more aware of what's going on now. And um, I thank you uh, and the comments I listened to from the callers and so on. And uh, But I'll, I'll continue on the book because I just got it today. And that's all I have to say. Spectacular. First time callers. Always great to uh, hear from you all. I'm glad you got a chance to call in. Definitely glad uh, if you're able to... Uh, continue reading the books to kind of go back uh, and pick up to get some of the other information because it's been a uh, just incredible read uh, incredible book uh, other folks who had a hand up that we have not heard from during the second session here uh, did you have commentary you wanted to get in anybody else oh did we get everybody anybody else who had a hand up uh, have commentary they wanted to share your line should be open if you had a hand up I'll assume folks uh, are satisfied uh, your line should be open uh, quick comments uh, that I wanted to get based on just what we heard in the epilogue and kind of wrapping things up uh, with the text um, in terms of not having black people participating in medical research, I do think that that is important. That is one of the aspects of racism that we have talked about on the program before, but that is the conundrum that uh, I just don't see. It is not logical to me to think that racists, whites who are in charge of financing, conducting uh, these research experiments, that they are going to have the best intentions in mind for black people. Uh, it's just no reason uh, to think that. If anything, uh, for me, <clears throat> there should be motivation to have more black people going into the medical field, uh, to have black doctors, 
black nurses, black people who are actually doing uh, the research and experimentation, that way uh, you have a much better chance of actually having some people who do have black people's best interest at heart. And even what some of the callers said about having black people who are actually studying racists the same way that they have dedicated centuries and untold amounts of time to studying us in order to maintain domination over us worldwide. Um, the portion where she said uh, that now you have black physicians and journalists uh, who join in to share information if there are any sort of experiments, egregious experiments on uh, black people. Uh, it's still my opinion that, yes, you probably would get coverage uh, to some of these things, but I strongly suspect that a lot of this, this sort of thing that happens uh, is covered up, would be covered up, uh, that whites still do an amazingly efficient job uh, at being able to destroy uh, paper, tra uh, paper trails so that they uh, are not discovered when they are engaged in these uh, acts of racism, white supremacy against us in all areas of people activity. I, I seriously doubt uh, that even the uh, best news outlets that they're going to catch all of these, whether it's black journalists or not, I just seriously doubt that they're going to catch all of these uh, incidents. That's just the nature of white supremacy. Um, the portion I thought this was really important in the epilogue where she says uh, she was talking about the drug efflorant. Uh, Florethanine. I hope I'm saying it correctly. I'm glad I did not have to read this text. Uh, it was supposed to deal with the sleeping uh, sickness on the continent, but it was too expensive, and the black people there, a lot of them, they could not afford the drug, so they found that uh, another side effect of this concoction was that it removed facial hair. So they said, hey, we'll just, you know, put a new label on it and repackage it and sell it to, you know, people back in the States, white people here over where. And she goes on and she says that... Uh, She's talking about them making this decision. This is Bristol Myers Squibb. They began marketing the drug as Vaniqua because many Amer American women were able to part with $50 a month to keep their faces free of hair, while few Africans were able to pay $50 monthly to save their lives. Just that right there. Black Lives Matter. Hmm. It is completely understandable that the firm should focus its resources upon the profitable debilitory use of their medication but it is disappointing that it chose not to make the drug available cheaply to Africans in order to vanquish sleeping sickness. I'll just, I'm pausing right there because in my view, I don't know if I would say it's disappointing. I would say it's to be expected. This is what I would expect whites to do worldwide, whether they're on the continent, whether they're in South Africa, wherever dark people happen to be, I do not expect them to have our best interest at heart. Uh, they were probably, you know, it was not even their original intent uh, to come and say, well, we're going to take care of your sleeping sickness. That was not it at all. I'm sure it was just, let's do further research uh, on these negras. And, oh, by the way, if we come up with a concoction that we can make some money selling off in the States to get, you know, sell to white chicks so they can get rid of their facial hair, well, then that's just, you know, a little bit of gravy for us. Uh, she continues. Uh, she says, uh, uh, I lost my sentence where I lost it. Oh, okay. It is completely understandable that the firm should focus its resources upon... Okay, I read that sentence. Doctors Without Borders forged a coalition which included Bristol Myers, Squibb, Bayer, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to provide drugs to Africans through 2006. But although sleeping sickness threatens 60 million people, only 7% of these have access to adequate medical treatment. Uh, just, again, in my opinion, when you have these mega uh, coalitions with meddling whites going to the continent. I think uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, they've been big time proponents of uh, vaccines and put huge asterisks there uh, with many people with their suspicions that that is all about racist intent uh, with what they're doing, propagating these vaccines, particularly on the continent, places with dark people. Uh, again, I just, it's, it's no reason for me to think that this is being done with any sort of benevolence, uh, that this is all about. We will go to the bottom of the ocean, study any grain of sand. We will go to any part of the globe to study Negros to find out ways to make sure that we can maintain domination over them uh, forever. Uh, moving forward, uh, the case with Jamikia, Barber, uh, she was in the armed services and she declined uh, the vaccine uh, where she said that uh, it might not be safe for females of childbearing age. Fertility, that is a main point, I think, that's come up in this book consistently and whites trying to find ways of uh, dominating, controlling uh, black fertility, black reproduction, uh, where she says, 
Uh, she disobeyed that order on grounds that the vaccination may not be safe for females of childbearing age. Black soldiers such as Barbara are twice as common in ground troops as in American society and so are especially vulnerable to measures such as forced vaccinations. Just brought up vaccinations. And again, having these environments where white people racists they control where blacks are they can manipulate large numbers of black people we're not going to give you access to quality education you're just going to end up in greater confinement or whatever else so here come pick up a rifle and we'll send you around the world to go fight other dark people and oh yeah by the way uh, we're going to do some research on you while we have you here they can easily manipulate black people into being in these environments so that it's large numbers or disproportionate i think that's been a key word in the book disproportionate numbers of black people in these environments so then we can do these studies no Nobody can say that it's all black people because there are non-black people present, but it is a disproportionate number of black people. So this is going to have a much greater impact on black people specifically uh, when they do these sort of tests that have questionable uh, health benefits and maybe even really adverse health consequences, which has been well documented throughout the text. I checked uh, online to see if there were results about her lawsuit. I did not find anything for Jamikia Barber. If people want to check to see if they can find anything related to her suit against the military. Um, where she talked about the importance of not having black people in particular, depending on the emergency room for health care. And we want to have quality health care for everybody because anything that's afflicting black people, it can spill over to impact white people. She says, I believe that caring for people and maximizing their chances at health and happiness are goals that we should pursue for their own sake because they are the right thing to do. They elevate us spiritually and socially and reaffirm our cohesion and our humanity. This is one, in my opinion, that it just comes down to understanding what it means to be white. They have zero interest in that. And I'm just making a flat statement. Either that's true or it's not. I might even submit this text uh, from chapter one to 15, since this is in the epilogue, what I just read from submit that as exhibit a that they have no interest in any sort of quote unquote cohesion with Negros. They're interested in dominating and terrorizing blacks forever. Uh, they just I mean, that is not on the table at all. And I think some of that, I think Mr. Demery for when he talked about the passage where they were releasing these uh, militarized mosquitoes in Florida uh, to attack black people. And they come down with all these health problems and people are dying and nobody knows what it is. Uh, and one of the black residents said that she just couldn't believe that they would do this. I think this is a reoccurring problem. And I think this has even come up in the book going all the way back to the first segment where it seemed that Harriet Washington, even herself at times, demonstrated a difficulty believing that an individual white person or whites collectively that they are dedicated eternally to terrorizing black people and this notion of some sort of common humanity and spirituality together that's not what they're functioning on at all if anything it sounds like maybe she uh, has believed in, unfortunately, the rhetorical ethic where whites say these kind of things, but they don't put that in practice at all, especially when it comes to other black people. Um, let's see. Uh, any last things I want to make sure I get in? Uh, well, she talked about uh, black people having to use e the emergency room as their first line of health care defense, that that drives up the overall costs of health care. I'm sure whites are very aware of that and they do not care at all. Uh, they just chalk that up to the business of white supremacy. And even when she says that when black people have all these health problems and it spills over to white people, they are very aware of that as well. And they just chalk that up as white sacrifice in any war. You're going to have some casualties and oh, well, we might lose some whites as a result of them getting a little too close to the niggers and, you know, picking up something or whatever. Oh, well, that is the price of doing business. On average, it's going to be black people suffering way, way more than whites. Might be a few of us that fall off here or there, but that's just the, the price of business. Um, the last thing uh, I'll get in, perhaps, uh, where she says pharmaceutical companies should be forced to make life-saving drugs available to people in poor countries, even when this means sacrificing their obese profits for the benefit of human welfare because the federal government sponsors much of the research that enables pharmaceutical companies to develop vital medications. The federal government should take advantage of its legal right either to force manufacturers to lower their prices or suspend patent enforcement in poor countries. That's another one where I say it just this is a fundamental misunderstanding of whites i just i cannot in my life imagine whites doing this something particularly that would be for the benefit of blacks ever uh this is a global team they're not going to intervene 
uh, to stop whites from making, as she said, their obese profits uh, because we have some sort of good intentions uh, for dark people anywhere in the world. Uh, I just do not see that happening ever. And again, I just come back. This is not a problem of rules, sanctions, laws. They already have rules in place. If whites were abiding by those, then we wouldn't be having this program. This wouldn't be a problem to begin with. I do certainly encourage what uh, kind of one of her last sentiments in the book in terms of encouraging black people to do research, check out some of the material that she provides in this book to be more knowledgeable about, more knowledgeable about so you can share with other black people that you care about, family, friends, whatever the case may be. If there is uh, a review board in your area, that would be great where you can go and see firsthand the types of things that they're doing. If they have, you know, different projects and what have you cooked up for your area, that would be phenomenal. I would definitely uh, co-sign and encourage that uh, big time. Anything that you can do to access more information to see how they're waging war in the area uh, of health care, that would be phenomenal. Super encouraged. You can learn a lot and the same thing. Pass on that information as well as encouraging more black people to research, study, access to health care. We need more black, uh, black doctors, black nurses, black health care practitioners. That would be a huge benefit for black people. I'll just emphasize again the, the top two points for me for the book. The sentence where she talked about uh, the control of black reproduction, that during slavery, uh, it was the rape of black females. We need you to produce more black children that can be enslaved. And then after the plantation era of slavery, white supremacy, it was reduction of the number of black children. We don't want as many of you all around. So now let's figure out different eugenics practices and Planned Parenthood to eliminate, reduce black fertility, which is still an ongoing project 2016. The other component where we talked about the experiments where they were done exclusively, exclusively on black people to reduce, minimize the will of black people so that they are not as articulate. They cannot think as well, bring research to figure out ways of controlling, dominating black people. I thought that was huge. And that seems to be a big pattern throughout this book, not just in the U.S., but in uh, on the continent, anywhere where you have dark people, individuals classified as black. I will stop there. Um, I guess before uh, we conclude, anybody have a, a final thought, something they can get in in like 10 seconds that they think we should get in before we conclude? Uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to say that book, Melanin Apocalypse, that the interview you did with that white guy is absolutely true. And this last section is uh, chapter 15 where she discusses the exclusive experimentation towards uh, chemical and biological agents that specifically attack and kill black people is proof positive that that is as true. He didn't conjure that up in his mind, which I knew when, the, when I first heard the program in the archives. It is as real as what we just read. Thank you. Got uh, disconnected there momentarily. Should be back. Uh, Melanin Apocalypse is Daryl Bain. He was on the program in 2000. Uh, 11, where they were at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, yeah, you have to just go back and <laughs> check it out. His science fiction work, uh, The Plague of Black People, uh, played out for real in this book. Uh, any, uh, anybody else, a uh, quick comment they needed to get in before we wrap up? Are we all good with medical apartheid? Uh, I didn't hear it. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say it's way deeper than skin color. Uh, really pees me when people talk about, oh, they hate us because the color of our skin. Uh, way, way deeper than that within our body um, that makes us uh, supreme. That's all. Right on. We will wrap there. Uh, if folks have anything else that they wanted to share on this, you can feel free, to, feel free to drop an email and we can share it on the program or what have you, but we are pushing off next week, brand new book, brand new book, Blood Brothers, The Fatal Friendship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X that just came out this year, uh, another time we get to do a book that is hot off the presses, uh, the author uh, Randy Roberts and Johnny Smith, co-authors actually, um, this book actually was published before uh, Muhammad Ali uh, transitioned uh, and it documents their friendship and then the falling out and all of that, uh, how that transpired uh, over their lives or even after Minister Malcolm's assassination and Muhammad Ali's life. Uh, but we'll be starting that next Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it should be available. I've seen it uh, prominently displayed uh, at the libraries and what have you. They were talking about it before. Muhammad Ali passed. I don't know if you'll have any difficulty now. If more people are interested in learning and reading about uh, Muhammad Ali's life uh, now since he transitioned. But that'll be what we start next Friday. 
Uh, I'm very excited, looking forward uh, to the book. Uh, let me know if you are having struggles finding getting your hands on a copy. Uh, we will be here tomorrow. Compensatory call in. Certainly, we will discuss what happened in Dallas, among other things that have transpired this past week. Uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, looking forward to exchanging views with folks. We'll also be here on Tuesday. Afua Cooper, black female professor in Canada, uh, discussing her book, The Hanging of Angelique, uh, Slavery in Canada, and a black female who looks like she attempted counter-racism, uh, and they tortured and killed her as a result. But that'll be Tuesday. Looking forward to having her on the program. Uh, with that, thanks to everyone for tuning in. We had grand participation, lots of first-time callers. Really enjoyed hearing everyone's perspective and just reading uh, a absolutely incredible book. I'm so glad uh, we were able to read this book together. I hadn't read it before, and as I said, it is top five uh, on Gus T. Renegade's uh, list of uh, just outstanding literature. You will learn so much about racism, white supremacy from this text. Make sure if you uh, get a hand on a physical copy of the book, look at the references. The bibliography uh, section, uh, biography section, has great reading material, articles, books that she cited, newspaper articles that have a lot of the additional information she discussed in the text. You can do a lot of research on this, probably years of research on this text. With that, thanks everyone for tuning in. Sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism as evidenced by medical apartheid. With the constant terrorism being waged against us, you do not want to be making it easier for whites to terrorize and do anything to you in life and or death. Certainly, if you're going to be in a vehicle, you do not want to be under the influence. Uh, you never know when you're going to be stopped by Daniel Holtzclaw, any of these other race soldiers. Make every effort to be as sober as possible so you can make phenomenal decisions and hopefully do everything you can to keep yourself as safe as possible. You and anyone else you may be responsible for. Uh, same precautions if you are a pedestrian. Buckle up if you're going to be in a vehicle as well. Let's do everything we can to minimize contact with race soldiers. That said, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately cows signing out thanks all for tuning in nigga you so brainwashed i'm a victim no brother problem. you're a victim man, i'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning shut up the man has programmed my condition mm -hmm. even my conditioning has been conditioned <laughs>